test.
go. It is May 21st, 2019, and I'd like to welcome you to the open session of the Lexington One School Board meeting. Um, I'm going to skip over the niceties because we have so many people and we want to hear what all you've been doing instead of what we've been doing. So I'm going to just welcome you and say we're on a banana peel towards the end of the school year. It will be here before you know it, blink of an eye. So do I hear a motion to adjourn executive session and begin open session? Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Green. Are there any questions or comments? Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries and it is unanimous. I'd like to inform you that the district is in compliance with the South Carolina Freedom of Information Act. By note, we have notified the media of the date, time, and place of this meeting. And we also want to notify you that the district tapes the meeting for accuracy in preparing the minutes. Um, and I'm going to make an adjustment that we normally don't do, but uh, our board secretary is, uh, had a prior work commitment, Dr. Powers. So I've asked Mr. Anderson if he would just serve as acting secretary in Dr. Powers' place. So I have my wing man right here, Mr. Anderson. And I'm also gonna call on Mr. Anderson for the invocation, please. We've got 10 days of school left and I looked through some prayers and found this one and thought that it was spot on for this time of the year, especially with where we are as a district. If you'll bow your heads. Oh God of all beginnings and endings, we praise and thank you for the gift of this school year. It has been a time filled with grace and blessings, with challenges and opportunities, joys and sorrows. The days have passed quickly, O oh Lord, the weeks, the months, the seasons, the holidays and holy days, the exams, vacations, breaks and assemblies, all have come forth from your hand. While we trust that, you, that your purposes have always been at work each day, sometimes it has seemed difficult to understand and appreciate just what you have been up to in our schools. Give us the rest and refreshment that we need this summer. Let our efforts of this past year bear fruit. Bring all of our plans to a joyful conclusion and bless us according to your will. With the fulfillment of our summer hopes and dreams, watch over us in the weeks of rest ahead and guide us each day as you have done this past year. Help us to return to school with a new spirit and a new energy. May we continue to grow in age, wisdom, knowledge, and grace all the days of our lives. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. That was really nice. A board in front of you, you have an agenda. Do I hear a motion to approve the agenda? Thank you, Ms. Green. Do I have a second? A second. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Are there any questions or comments regarding the agenda? Hearing none, we'll take a vote. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries and it is unanimous. Uh, board, you also have the minutes of April 30th, 2019. Um, you, you have been provided copies of the minutes for that date. Other than the corrections that have already been provided and made, are there any additions or corrections to the minutes of the April 30th, 2019 board meeting? Hearing none, we will accept the minutes as received. Uh, board, we have reports and action items from executive sh session. Do I hear a motion to approve 52 certified recommendations for the 2019-2020 school year? Thank you, Ms. Green. Do I have a second? A second. Thank you, Mr. Oswald. Are there any questions or comments regarding those 52 positions? Hearing none, we'll take a vote. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion carries and it is unanimous. At this time, board, do I hear a motion to approve four administrative recommendations for the 2019-2020 school year? I so move. Thank you, Mr. Oswald. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Green. Are there any questions or comments regarding those four administrative positions? 
Hearing none, we'll take a vote. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries and it is unanimous. Board members, uh, we'll go ahead and get the motion on the floor so that we can discuss it and then at that point we'll um, open it up for questions. Do I hear a motion regarding the relocation of Lexington Middle School? Madam Chair, I move that the board authorize the administration to amend the option agreement related to two parcels known by Lexington County as TMS number 004300 04016 containing approximately 23.57 acres and TMS number 0043000004075 containing approximately 10 acres with Teresa W. Betzel for the purpose of relocating Lexington Middle School by adding Exhibit B which establishes the purchase price of $1,594,575 this is $47,500 per acre. Thank you, Ms. Green. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. At this point, we will open up the floor for questions and comments. I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Salter so he can walk us through that motion. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. Uh, as you recall, Exhibit B of your option agreement uh, simply establishes a negotiated price uh, for the option and does nothing else uh, than that. Um, we have received two appraisals on the selected uh, property in discussion. Um, the appraisals, the first appraisal came in at $2,050,000 uh, for an average of $61,066 per acre. The second appraisal came in at $1,578,000 for an appraisal of, uh, or an average cost of $47,000 an acre. Uh, the district uh, negotiated the price at, at that you mentioned at $47,500 an acre uh, for the property. Thank you. Are there any other questions for Mr. Salters? Okay, hearing none, we'll take a vote on the motion regarding the relocation of Lexington Middle School. All those in fa oh, before Madam I Chair. do that, excuse me, yeah, let me remind the uh, audience and the, for the minutes that Dr. Guyton has recused himself due to the proximity of his office to this location. So it, we, uh, Dr. Uh, Guyton has recused himself. Okay, can I just say something? Yeah. Mr. Salters, I, I don't know if you clarified that this is only for half of the original property that we talked about in a previous board meeting. Uh, this is for 33.57 acres and there's a remaining parcel um, that is less than half of, of this property. Right. Good question. Okay, any other questions or comments, board? And, and just to clarify, this is just establishing the price within the option agreement that we will still have an opportunity once all the due diligence is done um, to approve moving forward with the property. Uh, yes, ma'am. There would be another vote uh, if, if the uh, due diligence process is successful. Um, that would be brought back to the board for final action before a closing would take place. Can you remind us what the due diligence process is? Uh, Sure, Dr. Little. We have a number of approvals that we have to seek, uh, including the Office of School Facilities at State Department of Education, um, SCDOT approvals, uh, where we do a traffic impact analysis uh, in coordination with SCDOT and Office of School Facilities. So there'll be a number of um, uh, site improvements uh, as well as uh, area improvements related to whatever that traffic impact analysis would dictate. We also do environmental studies, um, wetlands mitigation studies, things like that to make sure that uh, if there are uh, issues on the site, um, those will be determined. So for example, if, if this happened to be a, a dump at one time or, or some uh, area where chemicals were dumped, uh, those things would be discovered through, through the due diligence process and um, we would use that in our decision making. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, and just as a reminder too to the um, audience, uh, the board is always open to comments. Uh, this is not a final vote. And if you want to communicate with the board about the purchase of this property, we welcome the feedback and we look forward to hearing from anyone that wants to contact us. That's what we're here for. So, um, At this time, we're gonna vote. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Okay, any opposed? Opposed. Okay, so we have, let's see, uh, Four, let me count because we're, we're missing one, two, three, four support and one opposition. Okay, and the motion carries. Okay, at this time, board, do I hear a, a motion related to the discussion of a waiver of a tiny attorney client privilege regarding an April 28, 2019 attorney opinion? 
Madam Chair, I move that the board waive the attorney-client privilege related to the legal opinion dated April 28, 2019, the district received from legal counsel, which addresses the informal state attorney general opinion to Ms. Garris about her request to the superintendent for district records and information. I further move that the April 28 opinion from counsel be made available to the public and media. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Green. Um, any questions or comments regarding that before we vote? Okay. All of those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Zero. Okay. So we have one, two, three, four, five supporting and one opposition. Okay. And so the motion carries. And at this time, I would like to read a statement that I have prepared for this. So we have now voted to release this document in an effort to clarify some misconceptions that have been made on social media and by others in the media over the past few weeks. With the release of our attorney's memo tonight, we intend to address some mischaracterizations that have been asserted in local media outlets and further propagated on social media regarding requests for information that board member Jada Garris has made of the administration. The claim is that the superintendent has repeatedly denied a board member's request for information because he or the district has something to hide. Lexington School District 1 has nothing to hide nor does its superintendent. Any assertion otherwise is not true, and I want to clearly say that again. That is not true. The superintendent works for the board, but his job is not solely to provide us with information and be at the beck and call of board members. His job, the job he was hired to do, is to manage the day-to-day -day operations of one of the fastest growing and most competitive school districts in the state of South Carolina and in an extension in the Southeast. The board must provide adequate time for the superintendent to effectively manage Lexington School District 1, a district that serves nearly 27,000 students and employs more than 3,900 full-time certified and support personnel. Not only is Dr. Little responsible for our students and their learning experiences in our schools, he is also responsible for a food service program that serves two meals daily and a transportation system. And in his spare time, he is also overseeing the building of three schools, a middle school in the Lexington Attendance Zone, an elementary school in the Gilbert Attendance Zone, and a middle school in the Pelion Attendance Zone. When any board member makes a request for information, if that information can be reasonably and expediently attained, the superintendent provides it. However, when the information requested will take considerable staff time to collect, it is appropriate for the superintendent to advise a board member to discuss with fellow board members the merit of the information requested and to ask the board to vote on the need to devote manpower and financial resources to prepare that information. If the board member is unwilling to work with the rest of the other members of the board, to authorize the research and preparation of the information, the board member is advised, again appropriately, to file a freedom of information request. However, in an abundance of caution, I have also approached the executive director of the South Carolina School Boards Association, Scott Price, and asked his opinion on the appropriateness of Dr. Little's response to Mrs. Garris. He agrees that Dr. Little's response was proper, lawful, and compliant with board policy. According to long-standing board policy, all powers of the board lie in its action as a governing body, and board members acting as individuals have no authority over personnel or school affairs. The board is willing to devote time in our public meetings or in executive session if the request falls within the parameters of executive session to hear and to consider information requests from each and every board member. Requ requests related to the cost of legal services and budget specifics are entirely appropriate for the board's oversight, and it is appropriate for those requests to be made in board meetings by the board. One responsibility all board members should understand is the wise use of your taxpayer dollars and the need to treat each request fairly and with prudence. 
The Lexington County School District 1 Board of Trustees is fully committed to empowering each child to design the future. Our entire focus is on providing an excellent education for our students, teachers, and staff in Lexington 1. We will not permit mischaracterizations or untruths perpetuated through social media and local news outlets to distract from that mission or to undermine public confidence in our school district. We are so proud to be Lexington County School District 1. Can I make a statement as well? I would just like to read policy KBA, the public's right to know, and it says since the Board of Trustees is ultimately responsible for all district operations, and you may see that the district's attorney agrees with that, um, individual board members are extended special consideration in obtaining information. Under normal circumstances, individual board members should make the request to the superintendent who may refer such request to the appropriate office for a response. Such requests will be processed whenever possible in a more expeditious manner than otherwise required by law and at no cost to the individual board member. All board members will be appropriately advised of all requests and the responses given. Should a request by a board member be determined by the superintendent to be unusual, the request is then referred by the superintendent to the fully seated board. Mm -hmm. So that's what should have happened in this matter. Okay, thank you, Ms. Garris. Okay, moving on. Um, we're going to do something a little bit different tonight. Um, we have such a full house and we have so many people waiting out in the lobby. We are going to ask that as you come up and your group receives an award, we normally ask you to stay till the bitter end. We are going to ask you to leave. <laughs> and what we're going to do is try to make room for the next group. So it's, yeah, and Anne Marie is actually going to see her daughter uh, receive some awards at River Bluff High School. So at this time, I'm going to ask Dr. Little to step down for honors and achievements. And I'm going to read the, um, let's see, we're going to ask him to step down. And let me get my other book out. Okay. We celebrate successes of many kinds during the honors and achievements portions of our monthly board meeting. We recognize the significant achievements of our students and employees as well as the contributions of and partnerships with our business partners and community organizations. Tonight, honor, tonight's honorees include state champion Winter Guard teams, members of our aspiring Principals Academy, and a reveal of the Joseph M. Biedenboe Administrator of the Year recipient, just to name a few. Some of our honorees could not be here tonight due to the spring end of the year concerts and awards ceremonies. However, we feature all of our tonight's honorees in our proof positive newsletter. That newsletter was on the sign in table as you came in the door. If you did not pick one up when you signed in tonight, please do that on your way out. It makes a great keepsake for our honorees and their families. In fact, you are welcome to take an extra copy home for any family members who could not be here tonight. Audience, you should know that if you try to follow along in the newsletter tonight, you might need to skip back and forth from page to page, as they are not in the same order as we will announce tonight's honors and achievements. In addition, we ask that you please stay until we finish. Wait a minute. I'm not going to read that, because we ask that you leave. So I'm going to ask as soon as you get your award, if, you'll, if you can, make your way out. And please don't call the fire marshal on us. <laughs> so Dr. Little's already down front, and honorees, when you hear your names, please come and stand with Dr. Little so we can talk about you and your achievements. And I am going to go ahead and apologize up front. There are so many names in here, and some of them are a little bit hard, and I can say that honestly because I had a very difficult maiden name. So if I butcher your name, I'm asking for forgiveness up front. So. Tonight, we're going to start with Carolina Winter Ensemble Association Color Guard Championships, Scholastic AA Round 2 first place, <coughs> excuse me, Scholastic Regional A Round 1 first place, Scholastic Regional A Round 3 first place. Hold on just one second. Okay, we begin tonight with three state Winter Guard champion teams from Gilbert, River Bluff, and White Knoll High Schools. These teams won titles at the Carolina Winter Ensemble Association Color Guard Championships. If you are not familiar with Winter Guard, an indoor color guard sport incorporating choreographed dance and routine with flags and other props. 
We will bring up each team individually and get a photograph before moving on to the next team. We are going to start with the Gilbert High Varsity Winter Guard. They finished first in Scholastic AA Round 2 and scored 78.43, the highest in their division. Team members... <coughs> Team members include students from Gilbert High and Gilbert Middle. From Gilbert High, we have Nicole Aguirre, Noelle Black, Skylar Blosh, Madison Bray, Megan Cook, Morgan Cook, Lakin Corley, Diamond Dennis, Isab Isabella Du Bois, Haley Hallman, Rebecca Jumer, Athena Knopp, Frances Ludwig, Madison Mears, Madison Reese, and Janelle Regalia. From Gilbert Middle, we have Riley Gartman, Victoria Huffman, and Julia Van Horn. So congratulations to our Gilbert ladies. Okay, and very tight competition for the Scholastic Regional A championships. Both River Bluff and White Knoll High Schools won titles in their respective rounds of competition. We invite up round one winners from River Bluff High, the Spin Club. This talented group of ladies won first place with a score of 79.19. Members of the Spin Club include students from Lexington Middle, Meadow Glen Middle, and River Bluff High Schools. From Lexington Middle, we have Lily Gardner and Amber Goodson. From Meadow Glen Middle, we have Ellie Corley, Allie, Allie Filling, Amelia Sexton, Sydney Smith, Mackenzie Tatralt. And from River Bluff High, we have India Brunson, Jada David, Jolie Dixon, Carolina Dupree, Brooke Gowder, Claire Hinky. Skylar Hustis, Brittany Johnson, Diana Lee, Claire Loopton, Marissa Schill, and Kathleen Wyberson. And so we're going to stop for a photograph and let's congratulate these ladies. Somebody hit it. <clears throat> Our final group of Winter Guard winners, White Knoll High's junior varsity team, includes members from Carolina Springs Middle and White Knoll High. With a second highest score of all three Scholastic Regional A rounds, 81.02, White Knoll won the round three title. Their score was less than a point away from the highest total in the Scholastic Regional A competition. From Carolina Springs Middle, we have Drew Mahoney and Kaylee Starling. And from White Knoll High, we have Fiona Cheatham, Lily Dazdisman, Leslie Gutierrez, did I butcher that? Leslie Gutierrez, Rebecca Hall, Olivia Herring, Gracelyn Sharp, Kaylee Sims, 
Sarah Sullivan, Natalie Warren, Jaseya Wilson, and Hallie Woods. Let's give this group of ladies a round of applause. Okay, we're going to totally switch gears and we're going to go over to the musical side of our students and we're going to welcome River Bluff High Steel Drum Corps brought home multiple awards from Music USA Spring Festival held this spring in Orlando, Florida. Competing against groups from around the country at the festival, they scored a 92 out of a possible 100. The score won them a superior rating, first place in the high school 4A steel band category, and the title of high school grand champions in the instrumental music category. Quite a list for this musical group. And I'm not sure if they're here because I know that River Bluff is having their awards tonight, so we'll see who all's here. So we're gonna bring these musicians up now Edgar um, Argumado, Kobe Beard, Matthew Bradley, Emily Condillo, Aaliyah Garish, Caroline Geese, Raymond Amurso, Eliana Langston, Connor Maston, Devin Maston, Carter Moore, Ann Kit Nath, Annabelle Nightingale, Riley Osment, Frederick Rattray, Dustin Segura Torres, Micah Smith, Stephen Stewart, and Corbin Wild. Let's congratulate these students. I just want to say it's quite the treat to hear them play. You feel like you're on vacation when they start playing their steel drums. They do a great job. Now we're going to switch it over to the Middle School Honor Choir. Would Pillion Middle uh, School's Connor McGee come forward? Is Connor here? There he is. Connor earned a spot in the Middle School Honor Choir chosen by the South Carolina American Choral Directors Association. Students from across the state auditioned for the group. After rehearsing with his chorus teacher after school, Connor performed for a panel of judges and scored high enough to receive an invitation to join the State Honor Choir. They perform next fall at the State Conference and Honor Choirs Weekend in Charleston. Let's congratulate Connor McGee. At this time of year, we recognize our career-ready students who took awards at State DECA, HOSA, FBLA, and Skills USA competition. Our DECA students won events including business law, principles of business management, and food marketing. All first place winners qualified to compete at the International Career Development Conference. We will start with the DECA winners from Lexington Technology. The winners from Lexington High include Alex Fellers, and Mihul Jane for travel and tourism team decision making. Here he comes, come on up. Aiden Peterson for quick serve restaurant management. Kevin Shaw for business finance individual series. And let's stop right there and take a picture. That's the LTC and Lexington High Group. Congratulations. Our next deck of winners hail from River Bluff High. These students combined to win 21 first place awards out of the 
30 competitions they entered. We recognize Isha Kapoor first because she also won third place for hospitality and tourism professional selling at the International Career Development Conference. There's Isha. River Bluff state level DECA winners include Jonaki Bosley for Learn and Earn, Ben Brown for Marketing Communications, Jack Collins and Jackson Jeffcoat for Business Law and Team Decision Making, Brandon Edwards for Sports and Entertainment Marketing, Esteban Figaro, Figueroa for Accounting Applications, Chada Bandi Gangura for Principles of Finance, Taylor Garrison for Business Services Marketing, Isha Kapoor, who's already right there, for Hospitality and Tourism Professional Selling, Darby Kilman for Principles of Hospitality and Tourism, Christine Kim and Iralise Rodriguez for Hospitality and Services Team Decision Making, Joshua Londi for Principles of Business Management, VD Mongrola for School-Based Enterprises, Tejosh Nedigatu for Hotel and Lodging Management, Mahi Patel for Financial Consulting Event, Isaiah Pham for Professional Selling Event, Hannah Smith for Food Marketing, Jonathan Tan and Albert Zhu, I hope I got that right, for Marketing Management Team Decision Making, Ben Williams for Entrepreneurship Growth Plan, Jackson Yeaman for Automotive, Automotive Services Marketing, and Grace Sal for Integrated Marketing Campaign Event. Some of these students could not be here due to exams or they are already at another awards ceremony, but let's congratulate the ones that are here. Yeah, that's great. Our final DECA winners come from White Knoll High. White Knoll High DECA chapter members Keegan Shropshire and Krista Stevenson teamed up to win first place for their bed and breakfast business plan. Congratulations, Ke Keegan and Shropshire. Oh, there she is. oh I said they're wrong. Keegan and Krista. Hmm. We have one, yeah. We have one more DECA rec recognition. If VD Mongrola, Ali Trotter, and William Winsell from River Bluff High could come forward. Are they here? There's one. These three students completed the DECA Association School Based Enterprise certification process with their Gator Town project, winning the only gold certification in the state. As store manager, VD wrote a 42-page business plan detailing operations of Gator Town, a retail store at River Bluff that sells drinks, snacks, apparel, and other merchandise. This group also advanced to the International Career Development Conference, where they took second place. So congratulations. <laughs> Okay, we're really going to change gears now, so we're going to head to the lake for our next award. How about that? Y'all want to go with me? Because we have some, some fishing champions to recognize. Would White Knoll High's Jackson Cash, there's Jackson, Caleb Chastain, Jamie Cummings, and Michael Hall come up front. For the second year in a row, Caleb and Jamie, as a two-man team, won first place at the South Carolina Department of Natural Resources Youth Bass Fishing Championships. Caleb and Jamie have completed all four years at White and Ohio, with Caleb's grandfather serving as their boat captain. Is he here? Let's get, let's get Granddaddy to come on up. Come on up. All right, let's get the captain. Yeah, we'll get the captain in the picture. Yeah. There we go. Oh, yeah, come on. If you got another captain, we'll take all the captains we can get. 
with teammates Jackson and Michael, White Knoll High also won first place overall at the state championships. How about that? Okay, let's talk about some numbers. They caught a total of almost 34 pounds of fish. That is six pounds more than the second place team. Congratulations and way to go fishing team. When's the fish fry? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've got a camera over here to your right. That's your mama. Okay, way to go. Thank you. Thank you, Captain. We're now going to head back to the world of business. Unfortunately, we have to leave the lake, and we have three winners to recognize. Tonight, we're representing Lexton Technology Center FBLA chapter, Lexton High's Meredith Cook, Hannah Martin, and Courtney Rucker won individual events at the FBLA State Leadership Conference. Hannah calculated a first place win <clears throat> in the personal finance category. Courtney reaped dividends in the securities and investment event. And Meredith demonstrated her knowledge of news and media with a win in the journalism category. Are any of those three ladies here? Well, let's give them a round of applause, even though they're not here. And by the way, we have a YouTube channel. And so if you have family and friends that couldn't be here tonight and you want them to see you winning the awards, just check it out on that YouTube channel. At the HOSA State Leadership Conference, several Lexington District 1 HOSA chapters won first place awards. We bring up Lexington Technology Center's HOSA representatives first. Compete, completing, excuse me, competing in the HOSA Bowl teamwork event, Lexington High's Paul Kim, Caroline McGee, Coral Shodwald, and Nathan Siegler won first place. So we're going to stop right here and take a picture and let's congratulate them. Our next winners come from the Center for Public Health and Advanced Medical Studies. Winners include students from Lexington High, River Bluff High, and White Knoll High. For instance, River Bluff High's Jordan Carroll, Miley Carroll, and Thomas Wilson, and White Knoll High's Austin Taylor won in a biomedical debate. Are they here, any of those students here? Okay. White Knoll High's Abby Dew and River Bluff's Michaela Jones won in community awareness. Are Abby or Michaela here? Okay. Lexington High's Madison Katula took life, a healthy lifestyle, and River Bluff High's Laura Witt won on the medical law and ethics knowledge test. Here she comes. Come on up. We've got one of them. Let's give her a round of applause. Next, we present the winners from River Bluff High's HOSA chapter. Winners include Huntington Cotton, Rebecca Dooley, and Emma Scott. They partnered with the Medical Reserve Corps to win first in MRC Partnership, a community awareness event designed to improve public health. Are any of those three here? Okay, let's give them a round of applause. And last, certainly, but not least, we recognize from White Knoll High's HOSA chapter, Juliana Mills, who won first place in clinical specialty. And there she is on the front row.
Next, we're going to talk about something that's really fun. And if you were ever free on a Saturday and there's a tournament in Lexington, try to go because it is super fun and super interesting. We're going to head to the archery range to recognize two individual state champions and one state champion team. Would our individual winners, Gilbert High's Gracie Howard and Carolina Springs Middle, there she goes. And will Carolina Springs Middle's Alex Massengill come forward, please? I tell you, they are grace. Uh, you should just see because it's so chaotic and they're up there just so gracefully doing their thing and so calm. Gracie is a double champion. She won the State High School International Bow Hunting Organization 3D title as well as the Bullseye State title. At the state championship, Grace, Gracie shot a 294 in the Bullseye event and a 292 in the IBO 3D event. Leading up to the state tournament, she finished first or second in every single competition but one. How about that? <laughs> and in the middle school division, Alex won the state bullseye title with a score of 292. And we just learned that Alex won third place at the Eastern Nationals held earlier this month in Kentucky. While there, he improved his score to 296, finishing third in a field of 2,900 middle school boys. Let's, let's give him a round of applause. We're going to pause for a picture. Did you already get the picture? And Madam Chair, out, is this where their, they? Um, yeah, go ahead. Is this where they shoot the uh, apple off of Mr. Oswald's head? <laughs> okay. They don't. You I'm can't get an apple to stay on Mr. Oswald's head. <laughs> I, I would only trust Gracie to do that. Okay, I'm gonna. <clears throat> I'm going to ask these two to stay here, so I'm going to call up the state champion archery team from, well, Gilbert Middle, should you stay? Okay. Archers include Troy Buck, Bryson Cook, Marcus Cook, Cassidy Craps, Sonny DeVore, Sidney Duke, Justin Elrod, Brisa Green, Kayla Hall, Bryson Hallman, Mackenzie Head, Blythe Hicks, John Howard, Haley Makuta, Connor Muskoff, Dorian Perriott, Braylon Peak, Lily Price, Starlin Robertson, and Justin Sharp. These Gilbert Archers shot a combined score of 3,298 to beat 15 other teams and they won the middle school state bullseye title. <laughs> At the state IBO 3D event, the team finished third. Congratulations to these archers for all of their hard, hard work. Way to go. Our next honorees prove they are ready for the career field of their choice at the Skills USA South Carolina State Leadership and Skills Competition. 
At SkillsUSA, students use their technical skills and knowledge in events such as engineering design, welding fabrication, marine service technology, and auto body technology. Winners from Lexington Technology Center include Lexington High's Christopher Adams for auto body technology, Gilbert High's Connor Bocor and Hunter Taylor and River Bluff High's Kai Godwin for welding fabrication, fabrication. Lexington's Grace Chinners for cosmetology, <clears throat> Lexington's Sophie Lewis for welding sculpture, White Knoll High's Isaac Nussbaum for carpentry, White Knoll's Brendan Welch for power equipment technology, White Knoll's Jaden Young for marine service technology, Lexington Technology Center also won first place in the TeamWorks event with the team of Gilbert's Nathan Brady, Lexington's Taylor Mathias, and Briar Pope, and White Knoll's Cameron Drake. For this competition, they completed a construction project demonstrating their ability to work together as a team. We're going to grab a photo and then we'll move on to our next list of honorees. Let's give them a round of applause while they're posing. Representing White Knoll High's engineering and architecture classes, winners include Skylar Bloom, John Kelleher, and Dennis Rowe for engineering design. Here they come. Michael Bush for technical drafting. Brace Hutchison for architectural drafting. Delaney Livingston and Ryan Wilson for additive manufacturing. We are proud of the diverse talent that these groups represent. Let's give them a round of applause. River Bluff High cheerleaders came away winners of the inaugural game day invitational sponsored by the South Carolina High School League. We have senior members of the squad here with us tonight representing their team. Let's bring up Carson Fanning, Caitlin Landry, Mason Martin, Taylor Martin, Heather Malden, Jordan Michaud, and Katherine Shepard. River Bluff cheerleaders displayed their sideline abilities and crowd leadership to win the crown in the combined Class 4A, 5A division. Earlier this season, the Gators also finished runner-up in the highly skilled 5A competitive cheer state championship. Congratulations, ladies, on a stellar season. That's wonderful. Hey, yeah, I think she wants a picture right there. Oh, okay.
We're now going to move to staff recognitions, and we begin with White Knoll High's Katrina Haynes, who recently joined the Executive Council for the National Consortium for Health Science Educators. The only educator to receive this invitation, Mrs. Haynes will represent teachers nationwide on behalf of the Health Science Educators Association. She will also spend part of her summer collaborating with other health science educators at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. As a Science Ambassador Fellow, Mrs. Haynes will work with the CDC staff to develop lesson plans for middle and high school classrooms. She will focus on public health and career opportunities. She can then pilot some of those lesson plans in her own classroom. Let's recognize Mrs. Haynes. Okay. We're, now, we're excited to introduce the latest graduates of the Lexington District 1's Aspiring Principals Academy. And as I call your name up, please come up and join um, Dr. Little. Carolina Springs Middle's Leah Serentopoulos. There she is. Gilbert Primary Sajada Wallace. There's Sajada. Lexington High's Brandon Basket. Meadow Glen Middle's Kyle Metz. And I hope I hope I said that right. Midway Elementary's Christy Graham. Pelion Elementary's Todd Brown. Pleasant Hill Elementary's Jennifer McNair. And White Knoll High's Adam Russell and Sandy Vining. Phase one of the academy includes a three-week summer intensive that engages participants in a standard-based curriculum that simulates actual challenges a school principal may face. Aspiring principals then complete an 11-month school-based residency under the mentorship of an experienced Lexington District 1 principal. We are so fortunate to have these people aspire in this academy. Thank you. Mrs. Haynes is not the only teacher working on new curriculum this year. River Bluff High's Jenna Howell and Ben Lee joined a project designed to improve social studies curriculum for classrooms across the country. Along with four other South Carolina teachers, Mrs. Howell and Mr. Lee assisted University of South Carolina professor Jerry Mitchell in designing an end of course unit for AP human geography classes. The group hopes to bridge the gap AP human geography students sometimes experience when moving on to AP world history by merging geographic analysis skills with historical reasoning skills. Mrs. Howell and Mr. Lee worked for several months to write the new curriculum and are piloting the lessons in their classes this spring. Thank you for your hard work on this super interesting project. So there we go. That's interesting. Our final staff award goes to a deserving teacher who continues to learn and grow. Would River Bluff High's Jennifer Steiner come forward? Did I pronounce your last name right? Okay. Mrs. Steiner recently received the Dr. Elizabeth Gresset Professional Development Scholarship from the Palmetto State Teachers Association. The organization gives a scholarship for graduate degrees to five educators each year. And before I continue, let me invite Kathy Manis up. She's the executive director of Palmetto State Teachers Association, and she's also one of our parents. So we want to have her come up with this award winner. Currently a digital learning coach, Ms. Steiner recently completed an education specialist degree in educational leadership from Arkansas State University. Congratulations, Ms. Steiner. That's exciting. Okay, now we're going to go to Carolina Springs Middle. If Principal Bryce Cockfield, Assistant Principals Ryan Carpenter, Leah Serentopoulos, and Keith Tollison, and teachers Angie Smith, Jim Cook, and William Knopf would come forward. 
the flipping group named Carolina Springs Middle a 2018-2019 Capturing Kids Heart National, listen to that, National Showcase School. This honor... This honor commends schools that build strong connections between students and adults that creates an environment where everyone can look forward to coming to school. The Flippin' Group seeks to recognize and celebrate schools that go the extra mile each day, building an environment where students and staff feel safe and connected. Carolina Springs Middle reports that implementing the Capturing Kids Heart methods decreased office referrals and significantly increased student achievement. We proudly salute Dr. Cockfield and his team. Way to go. And I have to say, the board uh, actually got to go out to Carolina Springs Middle this year and see it in action, and it is, oh, it's exciting. Okay, we've got, we're going to really change gears now. We're going to go to the Educational Foundation, Joseph M. Biedenbo, Administrator of the Year Award. We enjoy learning who is the winner of the Joseph M. Biedenbo Administrator of the Year each year. As you can imagine, it is a difficult job to choose just one administrator from our outstanding group of administrators. And I'd like to call on Julie Washburn, who's already there. She's the Executive Director of the Lexington One Educational Foundation to reveal our honoree. Okay. Thanks, y'all, for your patience. Um, I am over the foundation, um, and I have the pleasure um, tonight of recognizing the recipient for the 14th annual Joseph N. Biedenbo, um Administrator of the Year Award. Um, this was established in 2005 by the Lexington One Educational Foundation, and it recognizes an effective and a deserving administrator within the district while also recognizing Joseph N. Biedenbo, um, who is one of the original staff members who was on the district staff in 1952. Um, he worked for the district for 36 years. He served as a seventh grade math teacher, a principal, and assistant superintendent for personnel and federal programs. He was also a World War II veteran who served in the U.S. Air Force. And although he retired in 1983, Mr. Biedenboe remained active in our district for many years, and we honor him when we present this award each year. And unfortunately, we're very sad to say he passed away in November, but we're very honored to have his son, Mackie Biedenboe, here with us um, this, after, you know, this evening to join us um, and, and represent the family. So we're very glad to have him with us and to honor his dad in this way. This year's recipient, I, I will say the committee um, I chose, um, they don't have anything to do with the district, but they complained because they did say it was a very difficult year to choose. We had some amazing individuals who were nominated um, and many who, who were very deserving, but I told them they had to vote and they had to choose. So it um, is based on points and the criteria that were actually established by Mr. Biedenboe. They, they go through and, and give points to the individuals. But um, this year's per individual um, was recognized for out outstanding servant leadership, passion, and a commitment to education in Lexington School District one for more than 20 years, despite having a very youthful appearance. The individual's been described as intelligent, transparent, strong, and credible. The individual has a, the ability to engage with teachers in a way that pushes them to be the very best versions of themselves and makes children feel heard, important, and believe they're capable of amazing things. Um, the winner is a team player who's been spotted sweeping floors and moving cafeteria tables when needed. Students commented that this administrator is super joy-filled and always in a good mood, which puts everyone else in a good mood. Another said the leader can make really good decisions on the fly. So, um, one employee commented, I've never worked in an environment that was so family-centered and generally happy. And another noted that the leader mentors and models best practices and recognizes every day that people and family matter. This year's winner has a passion for reading that's shared with the students. And the individual can be strong, supportive, and empathetic in very tough situations. And the winner demonstrates on a daily basis the qualities that Mr. Beanbow cherished in an exceptional leader. 
And it's for all these reasons and for this individual's exceptional commitment to excellence in education that I'm pleased to present the 2019 Joseph and Bedenbo Administrator of the Year Award to Ms. Jennifer Stanley. <laughs> I will say reading it, um, I, I always glance through them as we receive them, and there are a number of things mentioned in the, the beautiful scrapbook that was created on Jennifer's behalf. Um, a couple of times that I was like, okay, I need Kleenex as I'm reading this book, <laughs> because it was just very moving. Um, one parent mentioned the fact that her special needs student was coming in, having a meltdown one morning. Jennifer, it was very cold outside, but the child was crying, had um, a nose that was dripping. She just took off her coat and wiped the child's nose and gave her a hug, and the, the child was better. Um, another staff, uh, individual staff member mentioned what a support she was um, in a very um, critical time in her life when she had the passing of a loved one. So just really some, some heartfelt things, and I think you're going to need Kleenex when you read that book. <laughs> well, I'd like to invite her Lake Murray family to come up yes. front. And y'all go ahead and be put. Oh, you want to do it out there? Okay. Okay. Aww. very honored that Tim Oswald took a chance on me at 28 with my backpack on coming from school he saw something in me um, that I didn't always see in myself and I don't know if Miss Price is watching but Devonna Price was another key instrument in my journey and um, she helped me learn so very much when I was at Oak Grove and I have to thank Dr. Little for taking a chance on me. Um, he knew me once, and somehow he decided that I might be, you know, worthy of leading such a phenomenal <laughs> faculty. And I hope I've done you good justice. Um, <laughs> so, but I just wanted to say this award isn't about me. This award is about my staff, and they are my family. And I am what I am because of them. Um, from our custodial staff to our housekeepers to our secretaries to our instructional assistants, they make me better. So I will accept this award, but it's really a reflection of you. So I love you all, thank you. <laughs> our former recipient is in the back. Everybody does. Thank you, thank you for doing that. Jennifer, congratulations. We're so proud of you. 
Okay. Thank you for taking the time tonight to help us recognize the many honors and achievements of our students and staff and the many generous contributions of local businesses and community. We absolutely love to share our news with you. And I think everybody's left that was supposed to receive an award, but there are certificates out in the lobby if you need to go do that. At this time, I'm going to take a privilege as chairman. I'm going to take like a two-minute break. So if y'all will just sit tight or take a break yourself, and we'll be right back. Goodness, you have all your principals here tonight. Yeah, I wanted them to be either this one or the next one. I think they didn't want to come to the one in June. Oh, wow. Here he comes. <clears throat>
Okay, we're going to move on to 9.0 on your agenda, which is citizens' participation. And the Lexington County School District 1 Board of Trustees provides a time for citizens' participation at each regular board meeting. There are a few guidelines, of course. First, in order to speak, you must be a parent or legal guardian of a student in Lexington County School District 1 or a resident and taxpayer of the district. Second, each speaker has three minutes. Third, you may comment on an agenda item, school operations, programs, policies, or other matters of concern. However, you may not speak about specific individuals, whether students or staff. There are other ways to bring those situations to the board's attention. We want to give everyone who came here tonight a chance to speak. For that reason, board members will not reply to an individual's remark. Remember, this is your time to address the board, and we want to listen. If someone makes the point or points, and that's, I'm not going to read that one. We also ask that you not clap or make any comments, either while an individual is speaking or after a speaker finishes, as that also slows down the process considerably. If you wanted to speak tonight, we ask you to fill out a card that gave us your name and address for our records. These cards were at the sign-in table. I do have one. Is there anyone else who would like to? Okay, good. So we'll have another one in just a minute. Okay. Is there anyone else that wants a card to address the board? Okay. Well, you can get one right here. Rachel has one. Okay. As stated earlier, you should not expect us to reply to your remarks, although we may ask you a question, as the board will not take any t action tonight in response to the issues you raised during citizens' participation, unless it's an, an agenda item that's already been posted. At this time, I'd like to call up Mr. Steve Baker regarding the relocation of Lexington Middle School. Um, he, is, he lives at 112 Cherokee Pond Court in Lexington, and welcome, Mr. Baker. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Dear board members, thank you for having me speak this evening. I come before you as both a representative of the town council for the town of Lexington and as a citizen affected by the decisions that are made here. My purpose in speaking to you all this evening is twofold. First, I would like to point out and celebrate the collaboration between the school district and the town. And then secondly, to publicly make known my desires pertaining to the proposed location of the new Lexington Middle School. The town of Lexington currently enjoys the best relationship with the school district that we can remember, and we are extremely grateful for it. Our desire is to continue our fantastic relationship with the district and to cultivate and grow that relationship. I want to speak briefly about and celebrate the many examples of collaboration between the town and the school district. I'm very proud of our shared commitment to student safety and the fact that Lexington Police Department has school resource officers supporting each school inside the town limits. In addition to the SROs, LPD officers also help provide traffic control and security for sporting events. I would also like to point out that the construction of Northside Boulevard is a result of collaboration between the town and the district. The downtown TIF district has been key to the revitalization of downtown Lexington, including the construction of the Ice House Amphitheater and was done in collaboration with the town, the school district, and the county. Also, the Corley Mill TIF district, where the town will be able to make significant road improvements at the Sunset Boulevard, Corley Mill, Jenny Lane intersection, is a result of collaboration between the town, the district, and the county. Additionally, the classes that the University of South Carolina will be hosting at the current location of the Lexington Middle School is a result of collaboration between the town, the district, and the university. All of these and many more point to a fantastic working relationship and great collaboration between our two entities. Anyone who would say otherwise, frankly, must be misinformed. Thank you again for all the ways we have been able to partner with you in the past, and we look forward to more partnerships moving forward. Secondly, regarding the proposed location for the new middle school, the most significant conversations that I had both as a candidate for town council and continue to have now as a member of town council revolve around traffic and what we can do to help fix it. I believe it goes without saying that anywhere a new school is placed, there will be an increase in the traffic to that location. It is my desire to see significant improvements to Old Cherokee Road if the proposed location passes, whether that be additional lanes, turn lanes, a cut through to North Lake Boulevard, sidewalks on Old Cherokee Road, or all of the above. <clears throat> Finally, it is our good fortune in Lexington to have fantastic schools 
And we know that a significant part of our growth we are experiencing is due to Lexington School District 1 being a leader in education in our state. Thank you all so much for the fantastic job that our district does in educating our youth and our leaders of tomorrow, well demonstrated this evening. Please consider this request as you move forward with the decision-making process and the relocation of Lexington Middle School. St sincerely, Steve Baker, Town Council. And thank you for providing a paper copy. That's great. Okay. Now we have our next, uh, okay. This, uh, the topic the person will address is transparency and Sherry Risch would like to address the board. She lives at 372 Bama Road. And what town is that in Gilbert? Is that in Gilbert, Miss Rish? Okay, she lives in, let me write that down, in Gilbert. And she has children at Gilbert Middle School. Okay, Miss Rish, go ahead. Okay, um, I was wanting to see about asking you guys, the way that you have addressed this, um, the notification of compliance with the Freedom of Information Act mm -hmm. request, uh, regarding to the way the fees have been spent, uh, the legal fees, right? That's what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, what about the ones that have taken two years to be fulfilled? Have they been filled yet with regards to the $1,800 in petty cash that have been spent? I need to know. Um, I need to know how every dime has been spent. Okay. Um, I need to know because this board has made some grossly irresponsible decisions as far as money being spent. It's absurd. It's obscene. I am so disappointed and outraged, frankly. There is, all of Pillion is not worth a million dollars, okay? For a piece of land to cost a million dollars to put a school on, it's crazy. Mm -hmm. When there's so much land in Pillion, there's so much land, plenty of roads, the excuses are crazy. Um, these are, just a few of the questions that come to mind. I also need to know if it is, as I understand it, I might be wrong, but I think I've got it. Um, Dr. Little has requested for Jada to file a Freedom of Information Act. Well, you can see that if it takes two years to have one filled and it hasn't been filled yet, why she would have a little bit of hesitance, mm -hmm. hesitancy in filing another one, because clearly there's no regard for, for a Freedom of Information Act already. Um, as far as, Councilman, you have something to say too? Okay. Um, anyhow, um, I feel like if it's not, there's no regard to, to, to fill one for two years, I don't know why there would be one today mm -hmm. or and also why is it that nobody else will cares to know about how my money's being spent it's your money too why don't mm -hmm. y'all say hey yeah jada i do want to know why or how or when or what i don't care if it was 15 cent i want to know mm -hmm. you know i don't understand so that's all those are my questions and and my concerns and there are plenty other people unfortunately they're not here today but well a lot of them did show up good but there are plenty of people that want to know these answers. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Rish. And um, Mrs. Rish, if you don't mind, I'm going to give your card to our uh, chief financial officer, Mr. Butler, and he'll be in touch with you about your questions, and maybe he can answer some of those questions that you may have. Great. Thank you. Anyone else want to address the board? Okay. If that is it for citizens' participation, we will move on. Okay, here, go, go, great. This is the relocation, I assume, which re of Lexington Middle School? Uh, right. Okay. Right. This is uh, Barry, Barry? Yes. Hames? That's right. Okay, Barry Hames. And he lives at 120 Mooring Lane. Is that Lexington? It is. Okay, Lexington, South Carolina. And Mr. Hames, go ahead. Okay. Um, really just wanted to briefly address um, what uh, most of us who have lived in Lexington for the last 35 years recognize, and that is uh, the traffic is off the scale bad. Um, was, um, had no idea Lexington Medical, or Lexington Middle School rather, was being relocated to the proposed location. Um, that particular street, um, Old Cherokee to Pilgrim Church, I, I, I can't imagine it taking on much more of a load now. Mm -hmm. It's already 
almost unusable depending mm -hmm. on what time of day you come through there. I mean, it sounds like an incredible nightmare. I, um, first question would be, will the road improvements be done before mm -hmm. the school opens? Mm -hmm. And, and do, could you elaborate on what the road improvements will be? Um, I'll have to get Mr. Salters to call you about that, but we have to fill out a plan with the Department of Transportation. We're actually, to be honest, they give us permission to build a school and they tell us what we have to do with the roads. So I'll get Mr. Salters to give you a call and walk you through what, we're, what they propose so far. Did, did they give you um, the, the parameters that they were assuming the growth of this area? Um, Mr. Salters has the answer to all those questions, so I'll get him to call you back with that because okay. it's pretty involved. All right, so this this is a done deal. There, that no, sir, it's is, not a done deal. No, we're doing our, done. no, okay. we're doing our due diligence now. That's right. what we're working with the Department of Transportation. We're working with they're doing soil borings. I guess were you not here when we initially talked about it at the beginning of the meeting? Um, I okay. was here. Briefly. I just didn't want to repeat yeah. what we'd already said. Yeah, no, we're doing our due diligence, and we appreciate all the feedback we can get. Yeah, and we'll follow up with you. Okay, terrific. Uh, is there a secondary location seriously being considered? No, sir. There is not an available location. Okay, so, all right. So mm -hmm. from that, one would conclude that it's probably a done deal. Well, no, not necessarily, but um, that isn't. there's not a secondary location at this point in time. Okay. Mm -hmm. There's not a lot of land <laughs> available in the town of Lexington. Right. It did seem like on the other side of um, Old Chape and Old Cherokee, uh, um, not nearly, you know, the traffic gets worse the closer you get mm -hmm. uh, towards towards escaping that, that particular area. And Mr. Salters will walk so, you through all right. that. Those are some good questions. Okay. Well, uh, I guess we have more traffic to look forward to. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Would anyone else like to address the board? Okay. Got another card. Do we? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, this is regarding the relocation of Lexington Middle School and the traffic on Old Chapin Road. This is Wayne Kirby. Yes. And he lives at 112 Spinnaker Court in Lexington. So, Mr. Kirby, go ahead. Uh, I'd just like to re reiterate uh, what the gentleman in front of us just stated that the traffic <laughs> at certain times of day coming from you know, like Highway 6 through uh, Cherokee, right there. Mm -hmm. It's just horrendous. And I know there's supposed to be a uh, Department of Transportation study, but if anybody's been in Lexington for 35 years like I have and seen the traffic increase like it has, something's got to be done. And it, we just can't sit here like this. So I, I hope this will be taken into consideration during this whole process because we do need something. It's just getting out of, out of control. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kirby. Would anyone else like to address the board? Okay. Well, we will move on. At this time, we, uh, let me see where we are. We're now at 10.0, which are action items. We're going to have a second reading on the 2020-2021 academic school calendar, and Dr. Glory Talley is going to present that. Let's go ahead and get a motion on the floor before we discuss it. And do I hear a, a motion to appro approve the 2020-2021 academic school calendar? Madam Chair, the 2021-2021 uh, academic school calendar is attached for second reading. I move that the board approve the 2020-2021 academic school calendar as proposed. Okay, thank you, Dr. Guyton. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Okay, at this point, um, we'll call on Dr. Talley to give us a recap about the calendar, and then I think the board um, wants to share some ideas with you. So go ahead, please. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. As the board uh, remembers, we do um, work with a, a district calendar committee every year to uh, recommend to you a calendar two years out. So this is the 2020-2021 academic school calendar. As I did last month, I do want to take a point of privilege and thank the uh, men and women who dutifully serve every year on the calendar committee. Um, they put in a lot of hours, a lot of good thinking, and I appreciate them so much. We did garner feedback uh, this year with the help of Dr. Phillips in our uh, assessment office from parents, students, uh, administrators, and teachers, uh, as well as all employees. And so we took that input and we have recommended a calendar 
Uh, as I stated last month, you will notice that it's a balanced calendar. Uh, there are uh, requirements that we have to follow when we uh, craft a calendar, uh, and it's all, um, all kosher as far as those details are concerned. There are periodic breaks. Um, we, we have the late start date, which prohibits us from starting earlier than we would like. Uh, that's a little plug for anybody who wants to call their legislators about flexing that start date for us. But we feel like it's, uh, when we craft the calendar, my charge to the committee is always our, our purpose is to develop an instructional, instructionally focused calendar, and we feel like that's what we've done with this calendar. So I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you, Dr. Talley. Are there any questions or comments, board? I have some, and I have a lot, <laughs> so get ready. <laughs> All right. Um, after reviewing this, and I've been on the board a long time, I think, as anyone will tell you, um, I think this is my either 18th or 19th calendar. Um, I have real concerns about putting a weather makeup day so early in the first semester of the school year. I believe we currently have it on November the 2nd, and um, I know, and I, I really appreciate that the calendar committee wants to test a weather makeup day in first semester. Um, I would like for the calendar committee to think about moving that up against winter break and pushing it as far as they can to the end of that semester. The reason being, um, we have that's an election year, and also uh, with Thanksgiving, that would be two short weeks in November, and it would be, I think it would be really hard on the students to have such short weeks. And I think um, if we, plus if we moved it closer to winter break, and if we do have a weather situation, I think it would, there would be more likelihood we could use it. So the other thing, Ms. Green um, had to leave early tonight, her daughter's receiving an award, and she asked me to mention, uh, she's done a lot of research on the calendar, and um, many, many school districts, instead of having three weather makeup days, they have four. So uh, she would like to propose, and I think it's a really good idea, is that we add a fourth makeup day in second semester um, because traditionally, I think of all the years I've been on the board, we've only used, had a weather issue in first semester twice in 18 years. Is that right? Three times, okay. And so on um, the rest of the years, we needed the weather makeup days in second semester. And as a former working parent with when I, my children were little, um, if I had had a placeholder on my calendar and I knew that it, there was a potential for a weather makeup day, as a working parent, it just makes your life easier to kind of know that and plan. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, just uh, designating a fourth weather makeup day would be a, a really good thing for our parents and our teachers so that everyone knows. Uh, because generally speaking, if we do have a hurricane, uh, one day is usually not enough. So we, we need more days to make that time up. And it also gives us some flexibility. So that being said, board, I would like to recommend that we pinned the vote on this tonight, that Dr. Talley go back and speak with the calendar committee, that our principals go back and speak with our teachers, and that our community um, hear this information and you know that we seek a little more feedback. We're not in a tremendous hurry. So we're talking about 2020, 2021. And then that way, uh, the calendar committee, that's such a, um, that's a hard job. It's a really hard job. And uh, let them go ahead and review uh, these thoughts that Ms. Green and I have, and then bring it back for the, the main meeting in June and vote on it then. So that's my suggestion. Oh, well, that certainly seemed reasonable to me, uh, Madam Chair. I'm happy to, uh, communicate that to the uh, calendar committee, and I make it very clear when we meet as a calendar committee, we're simply making a recommendation. Right. The board has a final decision on that, so I have no problem with that. Be happy to do that and bring it back uh, for vote in June, if that's the pleasure okay, of the great. board. Any other comments, board? Dr. Guyton? I was just gonna, so we do talk a lot about the, the start date and the, the limitations that were under there. If that limitation were removed, what would that look like? Well, first of all, you'd see me doing a happy dance mm -hmm. and a lot of the calendar committee members, because uh, it, it is a restrictive, frankly. Mm -hmm. So it would mean for us, I, speak, I, I think I speak on behalf of our principals and our teachers in the calendar committee, we would love to, to um, start school earlier, mm -hmm. uh, and it would give us flexibility to have more breaks during the year. Uh, and the, the key for me is to be able to finish exams before winter break. 
the way we don't have the uh, luxury to do that, and it really prohibits us from what we can do, and that's very popular um, in our district. However, when you do that, you don't have a balanced calendar. Sure. So that those would be the main points, I think. We and, and I'll tell you, Dr. Little and I have talked a lot about it. It's no secret that there's one uh, district in the state that sort of um, controls this this date. Uh, we, we would like just to see um, the legislature give each district their own flexibility. I feel like what we need in our district perhaps is not what another district might need. Sure. So uh, we would love to have that flexibility, Dr. Guyton. Yes, thank so, you. To, to show you, when, when's the first day of school on that calendar? So the first day of school here is uh, August 18. All right, so if we had a little flexibility, and this is what we keep trying to talk to our legislature about, sure. we're talking about tweaking this thing. So we're not talking about starting school on August the 1st or somehow starting school on August the 1st and finishing, you know, June 15th. It, it, that's not what this is. It's really just shifting it back really just a handful of days, probably, you know, seven or eight days. So, you know, in that particular case, if August the 18th is the first day of school, maybe we would propose it that year to be August the 12th. Um, you know, just, you know, just sliding it back just, a, um, you know, four or five days, depending on the year when it falls. Uh, we just need them to give us a little flexibility and to tweak, especially if we talked about hurricanes. We talked about, you know, our schools are used as evacuation places. Mm -hmm. And that's, a, that's a, a task that we take seriously, that we really embrace that for our citizens. And yet, they don't give us any flexibility, though, to address that. Like, in, in the last couple years that I've been here, uh, fall has been the, the weather makeup stuff. But actually, the days impacted by storms, it's been almost nothing, right? I think the joke this year was it was a hurricane, <laughs> right? Um, and so, we, would have, we had a number of days before we actually, you know, were impacted by... Uh, by the, you know any type of bad weather, so giving us a little flexibility and that would be a, would go a long way. What it would also look like is then we could have some conversations about February and March. So in between January, uh, whenever MLK Day falls and when spring break falls, that's the other big gap. Mm -hmm. And and teachers and staff and parents as well will tell you that's a that can be a long stretch, especially if there's no break in between you know, those two areas. And it would give us some flexibility to maybe play with some guaranteed days off, like a Friday here and there uh, that parents could plan for, but also it could kind of give a breather to both students and staff as we make our way to spring break, which is what our first semester looks like, right? I mean, you have, you have breaks every month during the first semester, but when you get in the second semester, there's almost no break for our kids. And I think an argument certainly could be made that just a little bit of flexibility would allow us a lot of a lot of benefits. So that's that's the message really to legislature. It's not we're not trying to revamp the whole deal. We just need a little bit of flexibility. If they could give that to us, it could have a huge impact for our kids and our community. And and that district is Ori County. Just I don't know if she was spelling that out for you. Um, so we need to we need to call those folks and say, hey, help us out just a little bit. Gotcha. And also just to remind everybody, the governor does have the capacity to uh, ask to use our buses, which he has done in the past. So there was one time we had to close our schools when it was perfectly blue outside and not a single cloud because they needed our buses to transport citizens from the coast. So it's kind of a statewide effort whenever we have a big hurricane coming. So any other questions or comments, board? Okay. I'd like to amend, I'm going to make a motion to amend the second reading. So I'm going to make a motion to amend the motion to allow for us to uh, move the voting on this to June and to allow for Dr. Talley to work with her committee, the teachers, the principals, and our community on uh, moving the weather makeup day and also look at adding a fourth weather makeup day on that calendar. So I'd like to make that motion. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Are there any questions or comments regarding the motion? Okay, we'll take a vote on the amendment. All in favor of the amendment as proposed, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so the amendment carries. So at this time, we have pended the motion to approve the budget. So, um, do I? Excuse calendar. Yeah, thank you. Do I? I'm trying to think. I need some help here. Do I? Do we take? We don't do anything with it since we just pended it, right? Who knows Robert's rules? I think you. Um, there was an amendment on the floor, um, and it was approved to, um, to, for 
for the person, the individual who made the, um, the motion that was on the floor, Kyle, I believe was the one who made the motion. Um, you just need to retract. Retract. Okay, yes. Mr. Guy Dr. Guyton, would you be interested in retracting that motion? I respectfully retract the motion. Okay, thank you, Dr. Guyton, and I believe Mr. Anderson seconded. Do you want to retract it? Okay, great. So it, tonight we will not take a vote, and we will pend it. And if I'll ask uh, Dr. Little to make sure that's on the June agenda for us to discuss and vote on. And that'll be uh, June 25th. June 25th. Thank you. Okay, board, we're moving right along. We still have a lot to go, though. Um, 10.2, which are student travel requests. Um, Dr. Talley has presented 17 student travel requests. Do I have a motion to approve 17 student travel requests? So moved. Okay, thank you, Mr. Anderson. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, we'll go with Mr. Oswald on that one. Uh, Dr. Talley, is there anything you need to discuss on those 17? Travel request? No, I just I would like to go back to the other item and just uh, thank the board for your thoughtfulness for really uh, looking at the calendar and giving it a great deal of thought. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Um, and no, I just um, if you looked at the travel request, if Miss Green were here, I'm sure she'd say um, most of the requ requ these requests are for competitions, state and national competitions that our students. Uh, they just excel, as you saw this evening. June's always a big month for uh, awards and achievements, so. Uh, just am, am so thrilled our students have the opportunities that they have to okay. do travel. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Talley. We have a motion on the, and a second on the floor regarding 17 student travel requests. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion carries and it is unanimous. At this time, we're going to go to 11.0, which is our superintendent's report. And from this point forward until we adjourn, board, this is for information only. We will not be taking any more votes tonight except to adjourn. So, Dr. Little, I'm going to turn it over to you for the second reading of the 2019-2020 general fund budget. Dr. Little? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Again, uh, in the interest of time, um, we're going to go ahead and just jump right into the budget. Uh, so, Mr. Butler, I believe you have a, a presentation and some uh, things for us for the second reading. Yes, um, Madam Chair, members of the board, Dr. Little, um, this is our second reading of our 2019-20 uh, fiscal year for our general operating budget. Uh, a lot of these slides you've seen before, I won't spend a lot of time on those, um, but we do have some changes and I'll, I'll try to go through those. So operating budget, which is what our general fund budget is, is for the day-to-day operational revenues and expenses. Uh, examples of some of these things are salaries, uh, printing and binding, advertisements, rentals, travel, professional, develop, uh, professional and technical services, supplies, materials, IT software, dues and fees, et cetera, any operational uh, cost. On the other hand, our capital budget uh, is restric restricted by law, bond covenants, did I hit something? Oh. Um, and accounting principles to use for buildings and uh, equipment. So some of the examples, um, other than buildings and equipment, we can use it to buy buses, library books, band instruments, and uniforms, those types of things. But the main point here is the capital uh, budget or capital funds cannot be used for operating expenses. Can I clarify one thing, Mr. Butler? I sure. think there is some confusion out in the community. I think sometimes I've read where people think that, um, you know, maybe we could not build a school and we could take that money and give the teachers a raise. But by law, when the community votes on a bond referendum and authorizes up for us to build a building, we're not allowed to take that money and use it for salaries. I yeah, assume. absolutely mm -hmm. not. As a matter of fact, when they, when they pass a referendum, we have to list in there exactly what the expenditures are, mm -hmm. and, and we're, we're restricted to just those expenditures. Right. Even if some other capital needs come up, we're still restricted to those expenditures. So our projection for enrollment next year, about 500 new students, um, 511. That's uh, pretty close to what we grew this year. So some considerations, 
Um, for the budget was to meet mandatory expenditures without sufficient state funding to meet those expenditures. And I'll show you some of that later. Provide for student growth, meet state and federal requirements, meet inflationary costs, things like uh, utilities, insurance, et cetera. Ensure quality and support for students and staff. We did have a change on this slide. Uh, priorities for the 2019-20 budget. Uh, we still have one that drive to 35. Uh, the state mandated 4% certified salary increase. Uh, the next two highlighted in green there are new. Uh, the first reading did not have a, a percent increase uh, for support or administrative. So in this second reading, we have a 2% support staff salary increase and a 1% administrative salary increase. Now we also have in here a step increase for all eligible certified support and administrative employees. Uh, we'll be opening Beachwood Middle School um, to supplemental student support and maintain current class, for class ratios. So class ratios, uh, one of Dr. Lill's initiatives when he came here uh, was to lower uh, class ratios, especially in the early years. So you can see in 2016 what our ratios were there, uh, 24 to 26 to 1. Uh, so by 1718, uh, when Dr. Lill came, we were able to make first and second grade uh, 22 to 1. Now the other uh, grades stayed the same. In the current year, 1819, we were able to go to 22 to 1 uh, in kindergarten first and second grade. And the proposed budget next year, we're still targeting 22 to 1 for kindergarten first and second, and then reducing fourth and fifth grade from 26 to 25 to 1. Another Can you go one back of, to that slide just a second, because I just want to make sure the board is clear on this one. In eighteen nine, or actually in seventeen eighteen, I guess, uh, is where we used some of those pool positions to reduce it. As the year went on, some of those numbers then went up. Right? You see what I'm saying? So you, it, you started the year with that, and then it then it moved up. This is a year that we've started, and that's that's where we're we want to really hold tight on that twenty two to one. Right. And 25 to 1. And the same thing kind of happened in the, uh, the current year, 1890 with kindergarten, um, you know, targeting 22 to 1. Um, but as the year progressed and, and we grew in enrollment in those areas, uh, some classes did exceed the 22 to 1. Do you know what the numbers were in those classes? I mean, it, it depends on uh, every class is not the same. Uh, some classes may have 20, some may have 22. Occasionally, when we get one to 23, uh, we can get you that data on what they are. I was just wondering if you had an average, kind of like what was here. Are you asking about kindergarten? Well, just in general, when it says some classes exceeded, I figured if it was written here, then you that maybe had that data somewhere. I, I pulled the numbers this afternoon. Um, for kindergarten, so this year's kindergarten, we started at 22 to 1, and then as the year progressed, schools like Forts Pond Elementary right now are 23.5 to 1. Gilbert Primary is 24.9 to 1. Lexington Elementary is 25.25 to 1. Pillion Elementary is 23.75 to 1. So if we were staffed at 22 to 1 at the start of the year, what would happen is typically the principals would be on my case making sure I knew that their numbers had gone above 22.5 and we'd be adding a kindergarten teacher and an instructional assistant. So that means that if, if we were staffed at 22 to 1 at the beginning of this year, we would have had to hire five more kindergarten teachers and an instructional assistant. So the budget is saying that next year we're going to be staffed at 22 to 1. So as those kindergarten numbers grow, each you know, at each school, principals like Margaret Mitchum will be on me every day to let me know how many um, kindergarten teachers, uh, students she has, so I can, and there's some other principals out here that are just as bad, but they won't let it get past 22 to 1. But that is, that's kind of what we did. We used, 
pool positions to get them down. Like this year, what happened at the beginning of the year, like a week before school started, we recognized if we took three pool positions and strategically placed them in kindergarten, and Rocky Creek was an example of someone that was lower, that we were able to take a teacher and move them from Rocky Creek to Gilbert Primary, and that started everybody at 22 to one, but they kind of creep up because people move in and have kindergarten. Does that help? Oh yeah, that, that answers it, thank you. When, when we look at the, the projection, the projected growth, and say it's 555, 75 a year, do they then stratify that to the ages to say we expect of that 575 that 60 percent of those are elementary school so that way we can kind of know to maintain pace yes, in terms they, of our hires and accounting they, for that in the budget so on when and they forth. provide the projections they do it by grade and so then we use these staffing numbers to try to staff by grade gotcha it's actually by grade by individual school and so that's taking into account those projections of growth for this upcoming budget year, school year. Yes. Gotcha. Thank you. I knew we had the information. I just didn't know we were going to get it that quick. <laughs> um, whoops. So another initiative of Dr. Little was not only to reduce class size, uh, but to raise teacher salaries. He called it drive to 35. Well, the goal was to raise the starting salary with a teacher with a bachelor's with no experience, which is our lower uh, sale on the teacher salary schedule, up to $35,000, uh, while at the same time increasing all teacher salaries accordingly. So in 15-16, we were at 32-161, 16-17 went to 32-804, and you can see it went to 33-132, this year it became 33,795, and next year we're projecting to fund uh, that lowest sell at 35,991. So instead of drive to 35, it became arrived at 35. Uh, it was actually almost 36,000. So. This represents the um, changes from first reading to second. A couple of things, uh, major things here was we really wanted to accomplish a couple of things. Um, we wanted to uh, decrease our dependency on fund balance, and I'll go into more detail on that uh, in just a little bit. So we went through and kind of tightened our, our budget, seeing, looking and seeing where we might be able to reduce some of our bu budget, so and accounts payable. We went through and reduced uh, some utilities, uh, some communications, repairs and maintenance, insurance and supplies to the tune of about 1.25 million. We also reduced um, our contingency fund by $2 million. And I know some people think, well, why do you need a contingency? Well, the next line might be a good example because at the start of the year, the state said that we were going to have an increase in employee health insurance. Well, then after we put first reading together, uh, PIBA, who uh, manages the uh, health insurance, come out and said no, that we would not have an employer health insurance increase. So we were able to reduce that by 656000 But let's say the state comes back and says, oh, you know what? We were wrong. We really have to increase that employer health insurance. Well, without that contingency, we would have nowhere to go uh, to get that money. So that's what that's for. Is that contingency, is it, is there a line item for contingency or is it embedded within each? It's embedded in the uh, accounts. It, within each account, it's embedded. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. gotcha. Um, and then, like I said, we added a 2% increase for support staff and one increase for administrative staff, to of about $1.2 million. Uh, we going through the, the process and sit, looking at our uh, enrollment uh, projections again and also seeing uh, where students uh, were enrolling and registering. We actually added 12 new FTE, which either those are certified and for support, 738,000. We did make some few minor adjustments. Uh, about 9,400. So as you can see, we actually reduced the budget in second reading by right around <coughs> $2 million. <clears throat> so 
So in our budget, these are the increases um, in our certified staff, seven new elementary school, uh, 29.8 new middle school teachers and licensed professionals, 9.5 high school certified and licensed professionals. Um, one thing that we found out is that we really needed to staff our special needs classes uh, up front because the trouble we ran into as uh, students move into the area of special needs and, and there are quite a few of them during the year. So we added 17.8 special needs certified and licensed professionals and then we do have five pool positions. Um, one thing I would like to see us work on would be possible to get uh, more pool positions for third reading but um, we've already made this budget about as thin as we can, so we'll, we'll wait and see. <clears throat> so startup cost, whoops, skip page. Okay, so this is um, the uh, cost uh, excluding Beechwood and then the, the Lexington and Pleasant Hill Middle Schools that will be feeding Beechwood. So this is basically kind of what our normal growth would be. Certified and licensed professional staff, 43.3. Support staff, 1.7. Central services administrative staff, actually a minus three. Uh, and that would be uh, my position since I will be retiring next month. Um, our director of accounting, and then also a director in uh, communications department. We had one school administrative staff, and then we do have some uh, supplements, additional days, and temporary salaries. Uh, the majority of that really falls under about three categories, uh, increasing uh, special ed IAs from seven to seven and a half hours, uh, third in third year increase in athletic supplements and then comparing ourselves to our psych our psychologist salaries to uh, neighboring districts we found out that we were behind uh, just about every district so we're uh, proposing an additional five thousand dollar stipend to all psychologists currently is three thousand so this additional five would make it eight thousand uh, Dr. Talley, could you and Mr. Butler talk about the IA increase in hours, where that came from? Yeah, um, with with the special needs students, they can't, you just can't turn them loose and tell them go get on the bus or turn them loose, go get in the car. Whether that's coming or going, they're getting out of the car, they're getting out of the buses, that they need help. So that extra half hour provides a little bit of time before and after school to help those students um, get in and out of the school was the main reason for that. I would just add to that, I would, I would give our principals, uh, who are fabulous, uh, a lot of credit for that. We started getting calls in the fall. Uh, they had some uh, instructional assistants who were on seven and a half hours and then others on eight hours. And it, there, was an, it, there was some inconsistency. And we, as John said, um, you know, our focus is on the safety of children and taking care of children. So. We needed to make that consistent. So, uh, and when people stay an extra 30 minutes, they need to be paid for that. So we're just trying to uh, clean that up a little bit because there's a need. So the total net, uh, excluding Beechwood, was 43 uh, staff members at about 3.4 million. And then we, we talked about excluding Beechwood. If you look at just the startup costs for Beechwood, um, that's 86 positions, about $5.7 million. And then as the students move from Lexington Middle and Pleasant Hill Middle, uh, some of the staff will go with them. So that's 17.1 from Lexington Middle and 34.35 from uh, Pleasant Hill Middle that will be going with those students to Beechwood. So the net increase is actually 34.55 at 2.3 million, and then Beechwood is due their second allocation um, for their library at $75,000 uh, for a total of uh, almost $2.4 million for Beechwood.
So I, I like to tell stories, and um, little just luck nudged me to tell a story. Um, so my daughter, um, you know, any conversation, the, be the best time you can ever talk to a child is in the car, because you get them confined and you can get so much information out of them, and they don't have any choice but to answer you. Um, and of course, you take their phone from them. Um, well, I was asking my daughter, you know, about about the move and and how she was looking forward to to Beachwoods, and um, the the funny thing she said is she was looking forward to the hallways. And I was like, "What are you talking about?" And she said, "Well, when I come out of my my room and we're changing classes, I have to put my shoulders like this and I have to put my head down, and I just have to walk forward because we're getting banged around so much by other kids coming in the hallway." And it seemed like a really like little thing to me or to, to probably any of us, but in a kid's eyes, I mean, the hallways in a middle school can be, they can be rough. And so she, um, she was most looking forward to the, uh, the architectural design, I think, of Beachwoods where it's like a natural funnel that goes smaller as you go towards the back. And as we were talking about it, I was explaining that to her and that would just kind of made her day. It's like it's 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 amazing what kids pay it um, in these schools and and how even the architectural design of the schools kind of responds to those very very little needs. And so that, I I just found that very interesting. I'm sorry for the sidebar. Okay, now this is our uh, <clears throat> excuse me our support uh, increases and and decreases. Um, they were proposing for next year. Uh, school, school support instructional, a minus 10.5. That's really due to where we're having to take computer lab assistants who are support out of the computer labs since the state's requiring us to have certified teachers in those classrooms now. So while you see a decrease here, part of the increases we looked at with the certified teachers will be those teachers going into those computer labs. Uh, support staff special needs, seven. Uh, school support other, 11.95. That's basically uh, housekeeper and custodial staff. Uh, for Beachwood Middle, that's Nettowitz transferring from Lexa Middle and Pleasant Hill Middle. Um, that, that's 5.75 and then 6.2 uh, for secretaries, secretarial assistants, bookkeepers, those types of positions across the district. And then central services support, we're uh, proposing adding two positions. One is a carpenter. This was in first reading. Um, as we continue to add to the size and number of our schools, uh, we've not added any maintenance personnel. Um, so we're at least uh, requesting to add one carpenter position uh, for this upcoming year. And then we need a, a computer technician at Beachwood Middle School is the other position. So we've kind of broken it down different ways, but this is the overall increase in staffing that we're proposing for next year. 69.1 uh, certified and licensed professionals at five million dollars uh, the support staff we just looked at at 10.45 437,000 we talked about the decrease of the central services administrative uh, of three positions 488,000 uh, the addition of the school administrative staff one and then the um, Self months additional days and temporary salaries. Uh, the reason that figure is different uh, because it includes Beachwood. So it also includes supplements for the Beachwood Middle School uh, in this figure as well. So their overall total, 77.55 positions for a total of about $5.7 million. If you remember last year, um, the state came out and said they were going to fund safety. Well, when they passed the budget, there was no money for safety. So we still added safety uh, 
in our schools. Um, and that's the reason we had the 4.45 mil increase last year was, was to fund that since the state was not giving us any money for that. So we're adding to that layered safety, um, a board certified behavioral analyst. And then we're also adding uh, four additional uh, school resource officers. Uh, this is a, a contracted service. Um, seven additional mental health counselors, $140,000 for a total of $558,000. So for those school safety officers, during second reading, we decreased that by $20,000, but kept the same number of officers. How did you do that? The 326,000? Yes, sir. During first reading, it was 346,256. I'm not sure I'd have to look and see. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so, um, the state funding shortfalls. Now we do receive money for reading coaches uh, and nursing physicians, uh, but particularly our reading coaches. Every year, every year that money becomes less and less that we get from the state. So for the next year, we we'll have to pick up an additional sixty-four thousand dollars for reading coaches. So basically, the, the way it works is the better your students do on the the reading test the less money you get. Um, so now the total shortfall for reading coaches uh, for the district is $617,000. The nurses, uh, similarly, they do not fund the full amount. So for this next year, we're having to pick up an additional 41626 and it brings that total shortfall to about $117,000. So just for next year, we're having to pick up an additional almost $106,000. This represents the uh, state funding shortfall, shortfall for mandated expenditures. Uh, total new state revenue, $6.8 million. And the first reading you saw was, was based on the uh, House version. This is based on uh, the Senate version, which I think the, the House has pretty much agreed to. So um, mandated expenditures, the retirement increase for employer retirement, $2 million. Uh, the certified and licensed professional 4% increase, $5.5 .5 million. Um, and then the certified step increase, about $2.5 million. So just in those mandated expenditures, uh, we're short from funding from the state, uh, $3.268 million. All right. <clears throat> the. Uh, Increases in programs and services. Uh, the additional school resource officers. Uh, this is basically adding the four resource officers. So we at least have a, a half-time SRO at each one of our elementary schools. Um, and then 250000 for contractual services for licensed professionals, positions such as occupational therapists, physical therapists, and psychologists. Uh, funds to replace fee reductions in middle school. Uh, another uh, initiative of Dr. Lills, he wanted to reduce the uh, amount that our parents were having to pay for fees. And we've kind of done that gradually, doing kind of doing things each year. Uh, so for this year, um, we're reducing the amount of uh, fees for middle schools that parents have to pay. But the schools need that money, so we're making that up uh, by giving them an allocation to, to make that up. That's the $100,000. Background check, $75,000. Um, first of all, background checks are becoming more expensive, 
And then secondly, it's to, uh, mainly to, to cover all of the volunteers uh, that go into the school because the last thing we want is to have somebody in our school who, who doesn't belong there. So, and then we have Code to the Future supplies, $49,000. And that's for our four elementary Code to the Future schools, which is White Knoll Elementary, Rocky Creek Elementary, New Providence Elementary, and Pillion Elementary. So a total increase of $800,000. We also had some decreases in programs and services. The first two were in uh, first reading, uh, startup supplies, and uh, re a reduction in executive leadership program. Uh, so those two were in the first reading. Um, so the next three really came about when we went back and looked at uh, the accounts that I mentioned earlier and trying to trim those budgets. Um, so utilities, maintenance, and insurance, a reduction of 359000 Communication expenses, uh, basically telephones, reduction of almost 60000 an IT a reduction of 80,000. So even though we had an increase in, in accounts payables of 800,000, we had a reduction in accounts payable of 734,000. So the total net increase is only about 66,000. <clears throat> okay, the projected revenue changes uh, the first three for local, state, and the transfers all stayed the same from first reading. Uh, now, if you look at our operational balance, um, for first reading, that was some $9.8 million. So for this uh, second reading, we're reducing that to $7.9 million. Here again, reducing the overall uh, increase in the budget. Uh, to $15.2 million. And, and I get a lot of questions about fund balance, so I just kind of wanted to uh, shed a little light um, on the importance of our fund balance, particularly as it relates to our bond ratings. So the last uh, ratings report we got from Moody's Investors, um, some things that they put into their release was uh, the, double A, the double A geo rating reflects the district's sizable and growing tax base, healthy resident income levels, a strong reserve and liquidity, liquidity position supported by conservative budgeting practices and the formal fiscal policies. Factors that could lead to an upgrade in our rating would be a material improvement in reserve levels and balances. They also point out that things could leave in a downgrade to our rating would be uh, operating deficits and narrowing reserve levels. Um, so that's one of the major, if not the major thing our rating agencies look at is our fund balance. Uh, here, here again, Standards and Poor's, their last uh, rating release um, <clears throat> said the district's GO rating reflects our opinion of its continuously strong budgeting performance, maintenance of its very strong general fund reserves, and good financial management. For management, they said we consider the district's management practices good under our fiscal management assessment methodology. Um, <clears throat> They say the management has formalized a reserve policy requiring the district to maintain a minimum of 7%, and we'll be increasing that to at least 10% here in the next couple of months. Um, however, its informal target is to maintain between 16 to 17%. So the Government Finance Officers Association recommends a 16.67%, or basically a two months operating uh, for a fund balance. And then for their outlook from Standards and Poor, 
Uh, the stable outlook reflects our expectation the district will continue experiencing strong enrollment growth uh, while displaying strong financial performances and maintaining its very strong reserve position. So on their upside scenario, um, all else equal, that they could raise the rating if the district's debt pro profile improves accompanied with uh, continued economic expansion and enrollment growth. What might cause to a downgrade would be uh, we could lower the rating of the district's experiences, budgetary stress from future debt plans or increased expenditures due to enrollment, enrollment, enrollment growth, causing reserves to fall below the levels that we consider commensurate with those of similar rated peers. And then I also had uh, uh, Mike Gallagher and his firm, uh, Compass Municipal, kind of do an analysis for us. So these are not my figures, they're their figures. And say, so, well, what if we did slip a notch? What if we went down just one notch in our rating? Um, so it came back and said, well, basically, uh, the finance and fund balance statistics comprise 30% of our rating. So that's how important the fund balance is. And looking at the last um, sale that we did, 137 million, if we would just drop one notch, that would cost us $2.6 million in additional interest. So if you extrapolate that out to the $365 million bond referendum, that means we'd pay about seven and a half million more dollars for those bonds. Yes, that's right. That's being triple A rated. Yes. Correct. Yeah. I mean, yeah. excellent job. Um, yeah, there's only, I, I think I saw somewhere I should have brought it. There's only about uh, four municipalities and uh, school districts uh, in the state that have a double A rating. And I think a triple A might be less than 1%. Really? So everybody else is less than that. So 7% state mandated. Um, well, it's, 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 or it's policy. policy. I should say mandate. policy, yeah. not state policy. Um, we roughly run 16, 5, 17, somewhere along it, or 16, <clears> 5, <throat> probably. Our un unassigned um, fund balance right now is right about 15, 15 point something percent. Okay. But if you look at our total um, fund balance, then it's up around 18 percent. So it was a slip. Is that one point or is that 10 points? If we were to experience a slip in our fund balance to, to downgrade us to a, to a single A bond rating, does that take us, or would we have to dip below 10, for example? Would we what now? Would we have to dip below 10% from 18% down to 10%? Oh. I mean, what's, the, what's the margin that we're looking at here? We, not, not immediately, okay? Sure. But if, we, if it remained lower, um, yeah, then eventually we'd get to the point where um, we would dip below that 10% level. So they don't look at one spot in time. They look at a consistent pattern over time. That's right. Okay. Mr. Butler, didn't, um, in my understanding, I think two districts just recently um, experienced problems with their um, fund balance, and I think Ms. Spearman had to, try to take them over. One was Sumter County and one was up in Spartanburg, if I'm correct, because they used the wrong funds to pay for something up in Spartanburg. And I think they were going to use fund balance to reopen a middle school they had closed in Sumter. And so it put that district in financial chaos, if I read the articles correctly. Right. And <clears throat> there's a, a, a accountability a committee mm -hmm. on the state that, that I'm a part of. And I was surprised that there are actually, this has been a few months ago when we met, but there are actually four districts in the state that have a negative fund balance. Mm -hmm. So basically they're broke. Mm -hmm. um, and now their policy is that they will not put you on watch or warning or take over the district as long as you have at least one month operating, which is 8.33%. I think that's being pretty liberal uh, to school districts. I think GFOA's recommendation is, is, is a lot more sound. 
mm -hmm. uh, when looking at a fund balance. All right, we looked at this last time. Um, this is the amount of money we're not receiving from Act 388. It's just a comparison of the amount of money we would receive from owner-occupied taxes that we're not receiving compared to the allocation we get from the state that, quote, is supposed to replace that amount. So that deficit's grown at about $4.1 million a year, and it is cumulative. So over the past 10 years or so, uh, we have lost $209 million uh, because of that. If you look at just last year, the $41.3 million, and then you look at what the state's not funding in EFA, which for us is about $15, $16 million. So just in a one year's period, you know, that's $56, $57 million, which means Believe it or not, we could actually reduce our millage somewhere around 200 mills if the state would fund what they're supposed to. So instead of 322 mills, we'd be down somewhere around 122, 124, somewhere like that. So. And then um, our expenditures I'll go along with our revenues. Um, then here you see a little bit of decrease in um, Salaries and related costs and programs and services, uh, increase of $15.2 million, and that represents an increase of about 5.4% um, in our budget. Uh, <clears throat> most of our money is in salaries and related costs, um, almost 88%. Programs and services, about 7.5%. And then utilities and maintenance, about 4.5%. This is the same as it was for first reading. Act 388 puts a cap on the amount of millage that a school district can raise. Um, so our current millage rate is 322 mills. So we get this allowable percentage increase from the state. So they said we can increase 4.72% under that cap. So it means we could raise as much as 15.21, the value of the mill being 282,000, uh, which would generate approximately $4.3 million. But here again, we are not recommending a millage increase, so therefore would not generate any additional revenue in this budget. So in summary, it includes 77.55 positions for growth, Includes a step increase for all eligible employees. Includes a 4% increase for staff paid on the teacher certified salary schedule. Uh, and then the new being increases, includes a 2% increase for support staff, a 1% increase for administrative staff. And then, as before, includes funding to meet state and federal requirements. Uh, includes funding to cover required inflationary costs and it does not include a proposed millage or tax, inc tax increase for operations. I'd be glad to answer any questions. Does this include a substitute increase in pay? No. Are there any other questions, board? If we, how stable are our expenditures for the fiscal year? So are they fairly stratified across the quarters or do we, do we experience peaks and valleys? The expenditures tend to be more level across the year uh, just because basically for teachers, we take their annual salary and divide it up evenly for, for each pay period. Sure. It's not like where you work 10 days in this period, so it's this amount. You work 15 in, in the next period, so it's this amount. It's spread out evenly. So that's that's fairly, fairly level. Now our revenues, on the other hand, do go up and down. Because as you inspect, expect, when the uh, tax bill sure. goes out at the end of the year, and then they're due by January 15th, 
a lot of tax money comes in in December, January, February. So we'll see a peak in revenue during those times. Um, but other than that, everything's pretty stable. So you probably run fairly short Q1, Q2, and then Q3, you have your spike, and then Q4 mm -hmm. it comes back. That's correct. Okay. And years ago, we always used to have to do uh, TANs mm -hmm. to even make it through those low points oh, because really? of the cash flow. Mm -hmm. um, but we've not done that in years now. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, board? I'd like to thank Mr. Butler, and um, he's getting towards the last one. John, we're counting down. <laughs> yeah, and I would uh, like to thank my staff. Mm -hmm. They're the ones who, who really put all these figures together and, and uh, put the rubber to the road. Um, that's a, a, a director of uh, fiscal services, Deborah Seymour, uh, uh, our uh, controller, uh, Donna Patton, Director of Business Services, David Cobb. Um, who am I leaving out? Uh, our payroll supervisor, um, Lindsey Price. Um, and then we also have our procurement director here, um, Jack Nichols, uh, who was also leaving in June 30th. Um, so I know he'll be missed in the district uh, very much. So. And I'd also like to acknowledge tonight we have a lot of our principals here, and you're the first line of defense in preparing the budget. And um, I know Dr. Little asked that you either come to this one or June. And he said, did you notice a lot of them are here tonight because they wanted to come before school is out. So we welcome all the principals, and we really appreciate the work that goes into working with John's team and putting together this budget. It's a big, big job. So we thank you all for all you do, and John, for what you, you and your team do. Thank you, and that's, uh, that's really true. We get a lot of support from our principals, um, and it's really not the, the, just the principals. It's uh, all of our staff, um, students, um, even some of our parents, um, and then it just kind of comes up the line um, to our uh, senior leadership team, uh, of course, Dr. Little's leadership, and then also uh, support from the board. We would not be able to maintain the the fiscal responsibility and position we have if it was not for, for the support of the board. So I personally would like to thank you all for that. Mr. Butler, I'd like to add something here, if I may, that I, those of you who don't know, I retired from the school district five years ago and came to work here in 1997. And before I got here, our fiscal services department has been recognized for outstanding service and awarded for the last 23 consecutive years. And I think that says a lot about where we are with our finances. Thank you. Dr. Little. All right, uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, Ms. Mary Beth Hill, we have a first reading, I believe, for uh, policy. So as you remember, or you, you may not remember, uh, we revised board policy BE in the summer, of this past summer, it replaced about seven different pieces and po parts of policies that, and as, as part of the South Carolina School Board Association recodification process. Um, since then, in the last month or two, you've expressed an interest in moving the starting time permanently for the board meetings from 7.30 to 7. And so this is the one change we've made to this to enable you to do that. So it's just presented to you for first reading. Um, you know, make sure to let me know if you have any other changes or questions about the policy, and we'll bring it back to you in June. I have a question. Um, back in March, you had said that the South Carolina School Boards Association recommends that the board not put a time in the policy. And seeing as how last week we had to call a special called board meeting just right. to change I the time? I asked them um, specifically if we could do without, and they said there is a statute in the law that says you should state um, for the whole year what your plan is. And so, it, like, if we call a special meeting that we haven't announced the whole calendar year, we can set it at whatever time we want to as we call those meetings. But when we announce, like we are doing now, one a month and then sometimes two a month, we do need to specify 
what that's going to look like. So it is easier to do it for you if we do it as one time for the whole year as part of the policy. I tried to get you out of that. I tried to get them to accept that the board would set it and give the appropriate 48 hours notice, but they said we could not do that. Okay, thank you. Any other questions about that policy? All right, Mr. Uh, Salters, and uh, I will say, just to decide, our, our experiment was starting at 7 o'clock versus 7.30. We're, you're not starting at a much later time, which yep. is very exciting. So a um, uh, little operations update tonight. All right, well, I'll be uh, very brief, given the uh, time of the hour, because it is still late. I uh, just want to bring some um, pictures for you tonight. We have a number of projects going on across the district that are really starting to uh, take shape. Uh, Beachwood Middle School, um, very excited about that uh, school coming up. Um, and we, we have some um, great work going on out there and look forward to getting the board out there here soon to, to uh, have a tour again of this facility. Um, but you can see from the aerial photos that the, the parking lots and drive surfaces are really taking shape. Um, and they're starting to, to finish up some of the fine grading around the building. Uh, and so it, it's really uh, coming together. Actually, you'll see in a later shot that the rear driveway accesses there are also paved. Um, you can see from the, uh, the design here, this is the hallways that uh, Dr. Guyton was talking about earlier. These are your student classroom wings, and they're, they're angled to accommodate that kind of that funnel effect that he was referencing earlier. Um, you know, closer shot there, the front entry of the building, um, and this is your, your main entrance uh, into the building into the secured foyer there. Um, here's a, a, a shot of the center commons area uh, with your classroom wings in this picture on the left and then media centers on your right and then you would continue down the hallway to your to your cafeteria space. Um, down to the right would be the gymnasium um, and uh, theater area. Uh, second story, see the hand railings have been installed um, ready for carpet and floor finishes there. Here's the gymnasium. I'm really excited to get the bingle up on the scoreboard. Um, and we see some school colors represented. We have our bleachers in and um, our Carolina blue, I think is what they call it, uh, trim there on the. On I've the, heard that's the color. I don't know. Uh, I, I, basketball I don't know. goal there. Maybe. It's sky blue. Sky blue. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. And apparently, there we go. Um, this is the cafeteria space. You can see the terrazzo flooring is, has been polished uh, in this area and they're finishing up some finish there. The, uh, we're scheduled for a DHEC inspection here in the next couple of weeks, and we'll get our kitchen ready to serve our students. A uh, closer shot of that, the servant equipment is installed. We'll soon be cleaned and, and prepped for, uh, for use. Um, this is a, a picture of the upper play field area. This is where we'll, they'll do some PE, um, kickball, softball activities, things like that. Um, and then another shot of the court, courtyard area, you're actually looking at the media center here on the left, the cafeteria space back here on the right. Um, and then the rear entry uh, for the buses, this is the bus loop. There'll be a canopy along the right-hand wall there, uh, picture there, and um, you know, drive and a turnaround down here at the end um, of the building. Uh, excited to show some pictures tonight of the uh, new uh, Pelion Middle School groundbreaking. We had an event, uh, it was kind of a whirlwind event. I uh, appreciate the board's attendance at that. Uh, we did two groundbreakings in one morning. Um, thankfully, it was not as hot as it has been this week or will be this week. Uh, we had some uh, students out there with shovels and, and very excited to, to start turning some dirt and Pelion at the relocation of that campus. Um, here's an aerial shot of that. Uh, uh, activity going on. Uh, we've started uh, doing some clearing on that property um, and you'll really start to see some bigger changes there here in the, in the near future. Mr. Oswald, please notice they did not use the after photo where you and I moved the most dirt. <laughs> you know, they used the before. Yeah, there was a big hole here we had to go back and fill in. <laughs> uh, so, uh, <clears throat> also very excited to uh, break ground at Centerville Elementary School. Um, and we had a number of ambitious students that I think would have probably given you guys a run for your money. Um, they were very disappointed that they I had to take their shovels and uh, get, them, get them back on a bus to school. So, but it was a great effort that day and, and really excited to bring um, that activity to, Peel, uh, excuse me, to Gilbert. And um, here's another shot of that. Um, 
we're a little bit further along in the permitting process on this uh, school than than at Pelion at the time. So the contractor was able to kind of get started mobilizing, um, and consequently we we have some um, significant progress on that site. Um, you 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 see the significant clearing has occurred. This is the first uh, classroom wing, uh, the front of the school. This is our prototype X plan that we build for elementaries. And so uh, you can see the, the beginnings of that classroom wing and then another classroom wing coming off this way. And there'll be one here as well and one back over here. So uh, it's really starting to take shape. We're, we're very pleased with the progress. They'll actually have this building pad ready uh, May 31st. So super excited about uh, that being on schedule. Um, and and progressing that school will actually open in august uh, of this coming year so um we're, we're really excited about that happening so any questions about those projects all right thank you very much i guess i'd like to apologize to ryan Poole um as he he and the team are getting ready to present our and van bauer is going to present our strategic plan and nothing gets you fired up at 930 at night, just like a strategic plan. I know y'all are excited. It's okay. Settle down. Settle down. We're, we're going to get there. They're, they'll be up here in a second. Um, this year, um, and I'm, I'm just going to intro this briefly and not try to step on any toes, uh, steal their thunder. Uh, this has been our first year. If you'll recall, last year we uh, adopted our, our more of a, a flexible and adaptable strategic plan. This was our first year of implementation, and we're going to talk about um, what that has looked like over the course of this year. And, uh, and while some of our standardized data doesn't come back until, um, I guess, September, October-ish, and maybe even November, it just depends on, on how late they are with that data, um, the conversation we begin to have is, you know, really standardization, you know, that standardized data does it represent everything that has taken place as part of our strategic plan? So we wanted to show you some different data points tonight that uh, we're also really excited about and the work that we've been doing. So um, take it away. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Little, uh, Madam Chair, members of the board. Thank you for having us here tonight to talk about our strategic plan. Um, this is a, we're ending our first year uh, of a three year plan and um, this first graphic just simply illustrates the components of the plan. Um, you can see uh, at the top we have our mission and vision uh, surrounded by performance goals and action plans. Uh, in the middle, you have our system commitments or, or if you will, our promises as to what we're going to uh, uh, make priorities over this next three years. Uh, number one is that students advance on time and are prepared for uh, life outside of uh, Lexington One. Uh, two is that we teach power skills, which uh, we gathered lots of input from our community in terms of uh, what successful uh, students need in the workforce. Um, we also have uh, number three in which we focus on having schools that are service oriented and uh, that we develop strong partnerships with our community. And number four is that we equip all of our teachers and staff members uh, with the necessary resources that they need to be strong advocates for children. So uh, that's more or less the, the uh, structure of how our strategic plan is set up. Uh, and as Dr. Little said, this is not, this is not a presentation that will uh, deliver lots of academic data in terms of uh, test scores and that sort of thing because that will come certainly in the fall when all those things return. But uh, this will allow you to, to get a glimpse of, of our, our working plan. And as part of our plan, uh, we need to monitor and uh, make sure that we're measuring our impact uh, over these next three years. And uh, some of the ways that we do that is through our school support meetings, which I'll talk about in just a minute, our state accountability measures, our district dashboard, which is, which is uh, very unique uh, to our school district. Lots of great work uh, on that comes out of Dr. Phillips' office. Um, our strategy and action team, which is a, um, a 
team of central service uh, leaders that uh, focus on uh, communicating the strategic plan and uh, training our, our principals and our assistant principals, our district leadership team, uh, on-site supports from Mr. Poole and myself. We work very closely with all of our principals, giving them on-site support talking through their plans, setting goals with, with those folks. And also we have groups of principals that form uh, critical friends groups and uh, we get important information and problem solve with those groups as well. Uh, as I mentioned before, the school support meetings are extremely important and we, we established those this year and we have uh, had tremendous feedback from all of our uh, schools about uh, the way these support meetings are set up. And uh, this is kind of an over, overarching component to our plan, and this is the way that our central service leaders uh, actually get into the schools and hear reports from our principals and their school leadership team so we know exactly uh, what their goals are, what their needs are, and um, we, we bring uh, teams out to these meetings all year long. And those teams uh, adjust accordingly to the needs of the school. And you can see that um, in these meetings we have school-led dialogue and we try to get specific to the student level because we want to know about what's happening with each and every student because our vision is empower each child to design the future. So if we're serious about each child, we have to examine subgroups and uh, we have to really understand what's going on in the school and what the needs are. Uh, just to give you some numbers here, we had 72 school strategic plan support meetings this year. Uh, 31 in the fall, 31 in the spring, and uh, 10 in the winter. And so the way that breaks down is that if you are a Title I school or you're a school with a new principal, you have three meetings. So that accounts for uh, the winter meetings. So now I'll turn it over to Mr. Poole. And he will carry you through some action plans. Thank you, Mr. Bowers. Um, so this plan, um, as we've talked about all along, was a, a very different kind of plan than what we've seen in the past. So I think our last plan submitted um, you know, five, six years ago was, was 83 pages. This is a six-page plan, and it's built to be adaptive uh, over the next three years. Um, but it does drill down to six specific performance goals. So we said, how do you turn that vision and the mission uh, and those promises that we make through the system commitments uh, to life in the schools. So we set six performance goals uh, that have action plans. And we wanted to just tell some of the stories of, of what we're seeing emerge through the years um, without final state accountability data coming up. And, and as we started to list all the examples of how we're seeing evidence that the performance goals are coming to life, I mean, we could be here all night, but I've already gotten a lot of looks from the principals. So we, we're going to highlight just some examples from elementary and high school. And the yellow arrows on these slides kind of point to we're still looking at, at where we want to grow in year two. So this year, if it was an implementation year, that performance goal one was around increasing the percentage of students who are progressing on time with the skills they need to be successful at the next level. Some of the things that we saw were an implementation of a really consistent instructional framework in literacy and numeracy, which was uh, one of the areas that we said uh, we wanted to really target. And what are the reading and math skills that we're seeing at, at pre-K, at third grade, at sixth grade, at, at tenth grade? And so looking at an instructional model that not only uh, focuses on the adults, but but how are we reaching every child in the room? And, and uh, for the board, when you've been on school visits, I, I think at the elementary and middle and high school level, you'll, you've seen some, some examples of this, uh, the teachers pulling small groups and, and pushing in intervention models to uh, really reach uh, all kids for their goals and what they need. So that, that's some of the examples that we've seen come to, to life. We've seen stronger uh, coaching cycles in our building 
and the numbers of, of cycles that we're seeing uh, through digital learning coaches and instructional coaches and leadership coaching and assistant principal coaching, um, everybody's talking about how to, to do their craft better to, to reach kids, and it's a very student-centered conversation. Um, at LTC and across the five high schools, um, we're reaching levels of industry certification and college and career readiness um, that are really demonstrating that students are advancing with the skills they need to be successful at the next level. And across our district, uh, students are coming out with 2,500 industry certifications this year, ready to go into the workforce or apply uh, to uh, college at Midlands Tech or in, in um, industry or, or the military. And, and we saw some celebrations of that yesterday as well at River Bluff um, with our military signees. So it's really not about um, just one end goal for everybody, but a celebration of all kids advancing with what they need uh, for the next level. So performance goals two and three were about um, the state asks every district uh, across uh, the state to look at how you're serving um, students um, who, are, who are showing signs of giftedness or, or uh, needs um, in, for acceleration. And we looked at a couple of goals in this area, one around uh, increased enrollment and access uh, in uh, classes that are um, what the state's now calling advanced learning opportunities. These tend to be accelerated honors, um, IB, AP um, courses, and dual enrollment now. And we have continued to grow that over the past few years, but this year particularly, we were looking at access, and we've increased the number of requests, and we've got over 5,000 requests for advanced learning opportunities in the high schools next year. Um, from uh, over 2,000 individual students. That's an increase um, in students of poverty uh, by over 100 kids requesting classes for next year. And we've got a 15% increase of uh, historically underrepresented groups requesting advanced learning opportunities in our school through our efforts. And we expect to see that grow and grow through the years. So performance goal four is about improving um, the conditions that lead to success. Um, there's a, a variety of things happening across our, our schools. So you see a real focus on advocacy. Um, and we presented maybe two months ago on middle school scheduling, where all the middle schools are looking at the social emotional needs of their students and building in this advocacy period times to, to really reach out and see. It's not just um, maybe the academic uh, interventions we need, but we've got to know who you are as a whole person. So the school schedule is taking it, that into account, and schools are from elementary all the way up to high school or talking to teachers about how do we support you and, and fill that commitment for to give you the skills you need to advocate for all students. We see uh, structures like CREW, we see uh, impact at, at White Knoll High School, um, we see restorative uh, practices and, and assistant principals. We've got 30 assistant principals that participated in professional learning this year around the relationship between relationships and, and management in the school to try to think of different ways um, to, to reach out to get students to be successful um, and, and to help support uh, all students. So we have Project Hope, and that's made a difference in the way we talk about students, and, and Mr. Caldwell's talked about throughout the, that, the year, and that there are plans for the next phases of that going into next year. But um, the, uh, the way that we're talking about student success and, and what it means to, to make all kids visible every day in every school um, has, has changed, we think, through the, the course of this strategic plan. Um, and it's been a real success. And you see that in individual stories of, of students every day. So um, Mr. Bauer's going to talk about, I think, the last couple of performance goals. And, and we're going to wrap up. So performance goal five has to do with our professional learning. Um, and our high quality, our high quality professional learning opportunities for teachers. Uh, the the uh, cornerstone of that would be our model classrooms that we've implemented this year to focus on um, the workshop model in ELA and math. Uh, we have model classrooms and lab sites set up in our elementary, middle, and high schools. We have 18 model classrooms. Uh, K-12, uh, two per grade level, and K-5, one per grade, and six through eight, and two at the high school level. We have 119 model classroom visits. Uh, we have 17 elementary schools uh, that have at least one team uh, doing a lab site visit, 
And just to differentiate between the two, we have model classrooms set up where teachers can actually go in and uh, visit a, a teacher who is highly skilled with the workshop model, and uh, they can uh, have hands-on learning. But uh, at our lab sites, um, teams of teachers can go in and study uh, with, with a highly skilled person, and then they can go in the classroom with students and practice the craft. So again, uh, these are practices that we implemented this year with great success. I think that every principal in here would tell you and teachers will tell you that uh, this is a really worthwhile experience. One of the, I think, the innovative practices there is that we've redefined what it means to have professional learning. You know, normally you just kind of roll out there and, you know, there's an old joke about dying during a professional development, nobody knowing the difference kind of thing. And, and um, you know, what I like about these professional learning opportunities is that they involve kids. And so they've really mixed kids in with the professional learning. So you're going to see it with while children are participating, or you go see it and then you participate with kids and practice the skills. And so uh, that's really a new take on professional development. Um, I think it's taken us a long time to get there, but we have really embraced that. And it's, I, I think that's been our, probably our most popular model or certainly one of them. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, we have in our uh, schools in terms of math, we haven't progressed quite as far in math, but we're continuing to work on building those sites. So we have 11 model classrooms, K through eight, seven elementary, four middle, um, and we've had 34 model classroom visits this year. Uh, and we're also in the process of setting up lab sites across the district in math as well. Um, just to mention a few other high leverage strategies, uh, reading recovery is, is a um, intensive uh, strategy for students in first grade. It's a short term intervention uh, that we use and, and, it, and it has to be administered by a highly trained teacher. And we're pleased uh, to have 13 new teachers in training for next year. Uh, 11 will be working on full certification and two will be doing early literacy strand. Uh, we've implemented uh, at Deerfield Elementary, Pillion Elementary, Oak Grove, Lexington Elementary, Rocky Creek, and we continue to expand and implement at Meta Glen Elementary, uh, Red Bank, White Knoll, uh, and this just continues to grow. We, we also have training sites where we have behind the glass training where uh, teachers can actually work on their skill and be observed behind the glass and uh, this is just a really important strategy in terms of, of uh, reading recovery. So again, high leverage, high leverage strategy with a great success. Um, the other thing in terms of professional learning that we're seeing is increased collaboration among uh, regular education teachers, interventionists, special ed teachers, uh, 4K teachers, never before have we seen this kind of collaboration and working together for uh, student success. So we're really proud of that as well. Um, also, our, our Teacher Leadership Council has, has gotten involved and, and revised uh, collaborative planning times for teachers, giving more flexibility for uh, collaboration across schools, across subjects, and also, we have uh, made some changes in the instructional fair model. Uh, they, uh, they've implemented a, a collaborative time uh, in the morning during that day, as well as some high quali quality professional learning uh, in the afternoon. We also have several cohorts for endorsements for teachers. We have uh, Read to Succeed Literacy teacher add-ons certifications. We have 49 teachers doing that through Converse College. Uh, teachers of Children of Poverty add-on certification, 18 teachers through Francis Marion University and English uh, to speakers of other languages, 24 teachers through the University of South Carolina. So um, we just keep getting better and better in the high quality learning we're providing for our teachers. And then our last goal is performance goal six, 
and this is implementing strategies to improve customer service, parent engagement, and community involvement. And I truly uh, believe that we shine in this area. We, we have so many community engagement things going on, there's too numerous to mention, uh, but just a few to highlight would be uh, showcases in the town of uh, Pillion with the Pillion Schools, wonderful event that they do every year. Um, I see Mr. Nelson here, Gilbert High School has a, has a showcase there to involve their communities. Um, we have uh, 3,400 middle school students who uh, have job shadowed, uh, 200 plus youth apprenticeships. Uh, in 2019, we had groundhog job shadows for middle grades. Um, 2,720 students off-site, 584 virtual, virtual shadowing, 209 other extended learning opportunities for a total of 3,513 students getting those kinds of uh, job shadowing uh, experiences. So uh, I could go on and on, but I, I, I imagine looking at some of these faces, you don't want to stay here too much longer. So. Uh, that kind of sums up that. So as we move forward, um, there are some questions that, that we're asking ourselves all along the way with the implementation. And it's not just, uh, are we seeing the, the plans come to life in, in action, but specifically what strengths are we seeing from this first year of implementation? And lifting up, what are the, the artifacts and examples um, what do we see in the environments in the schools? What are the changes that we're seeing for kids to indicate that we're in, moving in the right direction? What areas need additional support or attention or emphasis uh, to make the plan come to life uh, across this short three-year plan that was designed to be adaptive? So we're constantly kind of gauging the artifacts to see what's working and what's not. Um, what actions by our adults are going to sustain the strengths that we're seeing for the students? And what actions by the adults in the system are going to address the areas that we're seeing in need? So these are the questions that we're entering year two with. And as we get more data coming back um, from different measures, uh, we'll be continuing to uh, flex and adapt to be that agile system that, that we plan to be. That, that last picture was the funnel of how we turn the big vision into action on the, the ground for kids. And um, we see that in a thousand different ways in our schools, and, and we see it paying off for the students, and we're continuing to have those conversations. So we appreciate the time, and we're here for any questions that you have tonight or in the future. Any questions, board? Can, can just, you repeat the number about the, um, about the children taking high-level classes? So children we have, of poverty and children of underrepresented population. Yeah, we have right around 5,000 requests going into next year for um, advanced learning opportunities, so, so IB, AP, or dual enrollment. Um, uh, over 2,000 kids making those 5,000 requests. So there was a, about 115 additional students that are classified in poverty that will be in those classes across the high schools next year, and that's just as we, as we are right now, not even knowing exactly which dual enrollment will be available, um, but those requests will continue to grow. Um, it's a 15% increase in students historically underrepresented in classes, so over the course of, of one year, we're pretty pleased to see that, you know, we hope to see a gain and, and it's double digits, so that's, that's encouraging for us. Um, and, and that's the idea to get in to rigorous college readiness coursework at the high school level and the right supports to show that everybody can can do this whether you go to a four-year college or two-year college or into industry um, it's giving the the kind of high expectations and skills that we want to see so the the strategies are working at least in terms of the requests that we've had and i want to say that van and i um, talk a lot about the strategic plan but i'm glad our principals are here tonight because I mean, we just kind of said you know hey you know what are you what are we going to do with with these plans and these ideas and they've turned it into reality and that's when we go to the school support meetings and talk about um so how do the commitments come to life and and they show us and they tell us and they generate ideas so they are like superstars thank you very much anything else dr little i know that you're sad about it but i believe that i am i am done for the evening okay 
Well, I just want to uh, share with you a few of the things that your board's been involved with since our last meeting. And I, I have to honestly say it's probably one of the most special things I've ever attended. And it was new. As of yesterday, we did a military signing day. We had 43 of our young men and young women who have signed to join a branch of the military. Um, we had the most wonderful um, event to celebrate them. And I want to give accolades to Representative Wooten and to Representative Calhoun. Um, they helped put that together along with Dr. Little and our principals. It was just a fabulous day. And man, it, you talk about something that was moving. Um, then Mr. Hearn invited us to the Future Farmers of America. And that is always one of my favorite events in Pillion. I never miss it. I try my best not to. And um, he just had a wonderful group of kids out there this year. In fact, I was telling him I got real teary-eyed when they unzipped that blue jacket and hung it over that fence because um, you just I think they just hated to leave their friends and go on to college. Um, Mr. Candillo invited us for Coding to the Future over at New Providence. And oh my, so wonderful. I had one little guy, he was coding a house. He couldn't get it to work. He was in third grade. He turned around to me and he said, give me just a minute and I will solve this problem. And in a, gave him about a minute and he fixed it and he built that little house. So uh, Mr. Anderson and Ms. Green uh, got to attend our graduation for students with special needs last Friday. I was so sad I was out of town and I think that was a wonderful event. That one is always, always wonderful. I mean, it, it really hits you. Yeah, it's great. And then Miss Green last night joined Mr. Nelson over at Gilbert High School for their celebrations of learning, and she said it was phenomenal, and she was so impressed with your students. And in the morning at 8.30, we will be with Miss Nichols uh, celebrating Rocky Creek's coding to the future. So thank you all, and we just appreciate the invitations you all extend to us and letting us see these kids in action. So thank you for that. And uh, board items 12.0 are items for board information. And I think we have this straightened out. We had somebody retire and somebody new take it on. And it was just kind of got kind of, I don't know, but it's been fixed. So that's good. And then 13.0 is adjournment. And board, do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Do I have a second? Second. <laughs> Mr. Guyton, all in favor, please stand up. Thank you.